Dollar, dollar bill, y'all. My bill folds are measurable in men's six cents. My presence like incense. It makes the room pleasurable. My credentials held on the highest pedestal. Pedal to the metal, hold the metal coast and settle any problems that are questionable. The ability for paper is impeccable. Solidity exceptional. Long bread agility for cheddar is incredible. Fuck with me up in Cipriani's basement with a zip or something. Welcome, sex pistol. So what mum says you're a nice boy. Any comment? <laughs> Who the hell do you think you are? Sex pistol. This is my girlfriend, Nancy. <laughs> You like me, don't you? Give me the feeling you're being cheated. Sydney's more than a mere bass player. He's a fabulous disaster. Sid Vicious is the sex pistols. I couldn't live without you. I'm your best friend. One man who has returned to England to try and stop a film deal is ex-Sex Pistol John Lydon. As we reported a few weeks ago on 120, Lydon is enraged at what he calls an invasion of privacy by British director Alex Cox's new movie, Sid and Nancy. The film's based on the life and death of former Sex Pistol Sid Vicious and his girlfriend Nancy Spungen. The source is close to Cox say Lydon walked out of a showing of the movie and has filed a motion in British courts to stop the film from being released in the U.S. The film, what? Sid and Nancy, uh, received rave reviews at the Cannes Film Festival in May and is slated for a North American release at the New York Film Festival in September. A side note to all this is that Vicious's mother was an advisor on the picture, and John Lydon talked to MTV recently about the downfall of his former band member. Sid was a very innocent chap. Uh, he tended to be naive and he believed what was written about him, which was unfortunate because it destroyed him. And I don't want to see that abused. Ex-Clash frontman and Leiden cohort Joe Strummer also contributes to the film. He wrote and uh, performed the title tune, which will be available on MCA Records in a few weeks. If Love Does Kill... You'll need a healthy dose of doctor and the medics coming right up after the break with their UK camp rock smash spirit in the sky. Hmm. Spirit in the sky. All right. All right. <laughs> Welcome to movie night extravaganza. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the Alex Cox film, Sid and Nancy, and I've assembled a panel of all men to, uh, you know, we're going to mansplain to everybody why uh, why it's all Nancy Spungen's fault, I think. Um, I, I think that was the plan. Um, all right, so I'm joined here on this panel by my co-host, but more than a co-host, a fabulous disaster, J. Andrew World, and of course my other co-host, John Ross, host of the John Ross Show. Um, rocker Conan Neutron, frontman of the rock band Conan Neutron and the Secret Friends, and host of the uh, Platonic Reversal podcast. Um, T. Derek Varn, host of Varn Blog, Varn Blog. I can never say that correctly with the <laughs> with both V's. Uh, and of course, the Zero Books official Doug Lane Wrangler, which seems to be getting a harder, a little bit harder every day. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> and of course, my good friend Cole James Cash and uh, his collaborator on this new album, Sunset on Sunset. Uh, F you. How are you guys doing? What's going on, man? Thank you for having us here. For sure. Um, I'm gonna let you guys promote uh, the album at the or the EP at the end of the uh, the end of the episode. Um, I think Conan also has an album to, to promote that I have a thing for. So that, that you used it in the intro just now. You used the song uh, "Say Nice." Yeah. Yeah. The video wanted, for that I, I just that came out for, this afternoon. I had that set up for last week, and it was gonna be yeah. Like, I had a power outage. Yeah. Yeah. And I was gonna, I was gonna kind of surprise everybody with it, and like not tell them last week that I was gonna do that, and I thought it was gonna be like a, 
like a, like a jolt to everybody. So that would be, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for playing. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course, Cole. You didn't watch the movie before nah. you didn't know that nah. you, didn't, you didn't know that there was that there was nah. wait you've never seen Sid and Nancy Cole nah nah all right don't ever talk to me ever again <laughs> you don't know, even know this album with you hold up right, hang up the phone <laughs> nah. I do want to say this though and F yeah I know you'll understand why I say this man like I live in the hometown of Alex Trebek right and so Around the corner, there's a big mural of the school that he went to. So I'm thinking about doing a mixtape called Trebek, but it's going to be like his eyes scratched out like the drug lords that they put on the cover of those rap mixtapes. Forrest, you know, I'm talking about all them Griselda Negroes yeah. who do that, but it's going to be Trebek. You got to call it uh, Trebek. 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 Tracks. <laughs> yeah, Trebek. Trebek tracks. And then like, you know. <laughs> Trebek. Three X's. Yeah. Tracks. Yeah, that's sorry. I, I got that stuck in my head. My bad, y'all. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to take this in a in an interesting direction to start out with. Usually, I play a clip uh, to start out the conversation, but this time I don't think there really is one necessarily. Um, I wanted to talk about imperial decline, which is kind of something that's throughout the first half of this movie. Uh, the UK half is kind of like the movie's dripping with it, and the punk movement I think in the UK was kind of dripping with it. The idea that you know, the UK was an empire in decline. The US is kind of taking over as the main like global hegemon uh, in the world. And the UK is losing colonies, losing respect, kind of economically declining. And, you know, that kind of anarchy creates a lot of uh, a lot of different art. And I think a lot of that art is posited in, in, in some strange ways where kind of the boredom and like the malaise that's kind of come over people in England is posed as kind of like a gray, a gray coloration. And I know uh, Andy loves doing the color theory parts of things, so I'll let him talk about this first. But it's interesting that both this movie and, um, you know, and Clockwork Orange, which is another kind of movie that takes place in, in this kind of dystopic, uh, you know, a, a imperial decline um, climate, I guess, in, in the UK, are both movies that are splashed with color. Um, it's not it's not the the grayness and the discoloration and the boredom that's leading to you know these uh you know this anarchy and this dystopia. Um, in fact, it's the fact that people are kind of just sitting there and, and they're unable to feel anything anymore, really. Like, you know, like, um, I think that the self-destruction that, uh, that Sid shows throughout the movie, and I think the self-destruction of, you know, all of the characters pretty much in the clock regard, similarly, um, like, I, it, 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 it turns into, like, this violent, the only way to feel anything is through violence. You know, like, in this movie, obviously, like, sex is kind of seen as something unappealing, and everyone's kind of constantly, like, covered in bodily fluids like you know they say sex is boring they're talking about how boring it is but it, it doesn't come out color wise as like a gray thing in fact the second part of the movie in new york city comes out kind of with this dark gray grayscale coloration um so andy i'll throw it to you first on that oh i um uh I, I wasn't necessarily, I, I was kind of swept away with, with uh, just Gary Oldman's performance. Uh, I kind of like lost track of colors, I, I hate to say, because uh, normally I, 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 I'm always looking at that. But um, uh, you're right. It, it is actually a very gray movie because um, uh, except for the punks themselves, like, like uh, you know, um, uh, Johnny Rotten's, you know, bright red uh, leather jacket and his bright red hair. Uh, you know, would stand out against you know the gray buildings of England there, um, and, and the. the uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is the buildings in England aren't necessarily gray. Like the buildings in England are somewhat brightly colored in a lot of places, and and brick and kind of. So the, the way that I think that a lot of people would expect it to be portrayed is that the punks are brightly colored, kind of, and then everything around them is kind of on this gray coloration. But actually, the way that it was shot by Alex Cox is that uh, England itself is actually incredibly bright. I think the way that it shot. Um, with the buildings behind it, the bright red trot, like trolley buses or whatever going past, like, you know, there, there's color actually splashed throughout the movie. And it's not the color itself that's kind of um, leading to this, to this like anarchic feeling, I think. It's the actual uh, climate of kind of imperial decline. If I may on that. Yeah. Uh, originally, Alex Cox, and by the way, this is an early Roger Deakins movie. Yeah. Who's like one I, of have the a, I have a Roger Deakins uh, clip to play. Yeah, and, and he's one of the great all-time cinematographers. I mean, he's that 1917 movie where the, that kid's just running around getting shot at, like, you know, for two and a half hours. Only reason that's worth watching is because of his uh, cinematography in, in my book. But they wanted to shoot in black and white. And the studio was like, hell no. 
you're not doing mm-hmm. that. No way. There's no chance you're doing that. But what he did is something really interesting because what you're talking about is the beginning of the movie is far more colorful than the end. So as like things get more and more tragic and as time goes on, it gets more and more washed out and almost as close to black and white as you can get. Yeah. Which leads to some shot compositions actually coming out in such a way that just the fact that there's color there at all, even muted, almost looks striking. And it's such a gradual, you know, frog in the uh, boiling pot of water kind of thing that you barely notice it. I think that's that's something I never caught the first time, but I definitely caught this time. They they do that with the uh, the Chelsea, uh, right? You see him standing on the on the on the um, the balcony, and it says Chelsea Hotel in bright red letters, and he's kind of everything is gray, and his skin is almost gray, and like you know, like white and gray, and like everything's desaturated, and then you know the the Chelsea Hotel is kind of in these big red bright letters it's like um, that mcdonald's hamburger meat gray yeah yeah and and i think you're right about you know as things get, get more tragic but kind of the the turning point of that i think is when he goes to the u.s like um kind of that's that's kind of because i've noticed um like their hotel rooms are always like this dark green gray color and even when they're in the bus the first time they go to america before the two of them go to america is kind of shot in a in a much more muted um coloration i think than it is when they're walking around the streets of england yeah um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's kind of hard to make the Chelsea look as generic as they make it. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, to be honest, um, and there, it's interesting. Your first observation, though, Forrest, about the movie that I didn't think about it till you pointed out right now. When they're in England, there is like sporadic acts of like stupid violence, even by school kids, in the background all the time. When they go to the states, that actually stops, but that's when that's when the lighting play really starts to pick up. Um, so it's it's like the it's kind of a a shift from an externalized chaos to an internalized one. But it's also interesting because the punks in America are also pretty vibrant, except for Sid and Nancy. Um, they're not you don't know them; they're not famous the way that uh, John Lydon is, but um, they're, they're actually pretty interesting. Yeah. And, and I think that, I mean, also there's kind of this disconnect that happens, I think uh, when he gets to the U S where suddenly he's not like in his stomping ground anymore, where people are just willing to like accept that, you know, he's, he's this disastrous person that's playing for them yeah. and that, you know, everybody's just like, you suck. And like, you know what I mean? Like, but throughout England, kind of the Sex Pistols seem to be able to get away with that, and uh, his decline doesn't seem as sad in that context. And you know, I, I have a clip to play later on where they're on an interview show. Um, you know, a few months I think before uh, before they both passed away. Um, and you know, it's both Sid and Nancy on this interview show because obviously uh, she's his manager at this point, and they're saying that oh well, we don't think that you know um, punk rock in America is is as political the same way that it is in uh, in England, which kind of does show that disconnect, I think, where um, they're kind of able to say, like, fuck this, we're going to fuck it up. There's a lot of uh, conversation where they're talking about how the Labor Party failed, and, um, you know, everyone's kind of destitute. They're all, as they say, like, on the dole. Um, so there's kind of this, this absolute feeling of economic uh, deprivation and malaise that follows them wherever it goes. And I think Alex Cox um, translates that really well. Um, I mean, that's Thatcherism too, right? That's that's what was happening around that time. And it was considered a failure of like the Labor Party and hippies and all these things that they were railing against. And were they railing against with informed critiques? Not really. Like it was, that, that's where the whole anarchy thing kind of came from. It's like, hey, everything is pointless. Everything is terrible. Tear it all down and start over again. Or don't, who cares? And... <laughs> I, I think that's vital to understanding like the, just the, um, the world that, that, that they're coming from. Uh, the also, I also pretty right wing brand. I mean, like, honestly, yeah. the pistols are a pretty white wing band. Um, you know, they're not a fash band by any stretch of the imagination, but they're both a, a commercially designed band and B B Leiden's politics has always been probably on the right of the British punk music. Even if he was fighting with fascists in the seventies, um, it's- Provocateur ish. It's I would kind say, of the same than. way with uh, the Ramones, uh, with Johnny Ramone being probably the only right wing punk uh, person in the punk rock movement. 
I mean, well, there's fash punk. So I was, I yeah. was, uh, well, we, were, we were talking conservative politics. I was like, well, that's that's mm -hmm. the only one. I, had a I, mean, I, I, I tend to plan. think, though, uh, uh, Leiden's a little more like uh, Dennis Miller in the 80s. You know, like he, he's yeah. not, um, not Dennis Miller of now, though. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, but like in the 80s, he was like railing against Reagan, but he was just railing against power, basically. You yeah. know, whoever was in charge, there's there's a, almost an emptiness to what uh, – uh, to, to what the Sex Pistols stand for, because it's not against anything other than like who's on top at the moment. And, yeah, and, that's, and, you know, that's, that's a big problem with I think anarchism as a concept, really. Like, yeah, because there's both. You know, there's there's people on the left that are anarchists that believe in a in like a state free uh, form of either socialism or you know just anarchism in general. But there's also like you know like a very right wing. Anar like anarcho capitalist tradition, which kind of grew up during like the closest that we've ever kind of had to that is Reagan and Thatcher and all of that, you know? So like the, the ANCAP, um, it, it's very easy for that anarchism. It's just, you know, let's burn everything down to turn it into like a, a right wing, like Reaganist revolution. Um, Cause I think we have lived through, or, you know, close to when we're all here. Like, I think we have been living through a revolution. It's just a revolution the wrong way. You know, it's a, it's a top down, um, like counter revolution rather than uh you know like a bottom up like workers workers first or even just you know uh populist revolution you sounded like pascal robert <laughs> the 50 year counter revolution the well, Forrest, hold up for us i want to i'm going to interrupt you because you know because i have to but <laughs> we i would just want to divert back to the movie because you said that they found so you said that they found the, the sex was boring. The, the one you didn't watch, right? That's the one you want yeah, to go back to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <man>. Um, <laughs> but the sex was boring, though, right? Well, the, yeah, that's like a quote from the movie. They should, like, and they should have gave him. Yo, Cole, they, Cole, they Cole, you since you didn't watch the movie, I'm gonna catch you up. There's a lot of sex. It, like it's basically a porno, bro. You gotta yeah. go back and watch it, man. It's, it's a punk rock sex porno. All the time, but it's <laughs> sex. It's like librarian sex, the whole movie. Up. You, it. You, know, you know what this sounds like you know how like Nas will say something sexual and it's the most disgusting thing you've ever heard <laughs> in your life he's got, these guys aren't going to get the joke man but yeah like he talks about it in this weird organic way it makes you not even want to think about it but the reason why I bring it up is because they should have. They vicious should have been looking for like Pinhead in that configuration if he needed to step his game <laughs> up like that. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying though, because like if you were to think about it, you know he wasn't getting enough drugs, wasn't enough. You know he got he got them sites to sell you. You feel me? So I'm just saying, you know, like I I understand everything that you guys are talking about, especially when you guys are talking about Thatcher and all that. But I'm stuck on that, man. Like I'm <laughs> stuck on. Well, you know? You're going to relate to this next part that I'm going to say is because, like, uh, one thing that wasn't really talked about in the movie is that uh, in the in the 1970s, whenever Sid met Nancy, uh, speed was the drug of choice, and then uh, Nancy brought a uh, guitar case full of uh, heroin uh, to England with her uh, for the drummer of uh, uh, Johnny. Um, oh, not Johnny Rockets, jo Johnny. She had a guitar <laughs> case full of heroin. Johnny Thunders, maybe? And yes, Johnny Thunders. Hold up, Andrew. Yeah. Andrew, she His had a guitar God. case full of heroin for the drummer of a band. And hold up, and did she didn't, did she sell band. that? Did she sell it or that's, different times, that's man? The story. That, that's smuggling. The story. I'm just saying, smuggling all that heroin, and you're just gonna use it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean we're talking. Hold on, we're talking about a fucking guitar case full of heroin, and we no. I'm a fuck. I'm for for real rehabbed heroin addict, and I'm telling y'all that's stupid as fuck. That's way this is overdoing. The story, it. okay. This is the story. I don't know how true it is, but that's just the story of Nancy Spungen right there. Um, you know, part part of Yo, her we legend. Should a, we should have a new podcast where we bring Cole on every week. He hasn't watched the movie. <laughs> and we explain to him what the fuck is going on in the movie, and he just reacts. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm, I'm just. No, no, hold on. I'm here because my close friend, my very close friend, Jamie Peck, has not appeared. I texted her. I sh I shunned her. Okay, I denounce and reject her. There. She she's like the punkest punk fucking rock fucking host in on the left. And she flaked I know, down on she, and she bailed on coming on the show. Yeah, don't worry. I don't worry. I texted her. She, you know, 
But yeah, um, but can hold on, hold on. Can I just get my opinion from my man F? Like, okay, so there's a lot of sex in the movie. What happened after that? <laughs> it's, I'm being sarcastic, Dick. I know you are, but sex, I know you are, but I want you to at least what else? Uh, a little bit of synopsis for me, please. Bro, we're talking about a fucking uh, world treasure, Gary Oldman, man. He 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 does one of when his best first roles. Dude, what do you, you have to watch this movie, man? And it's about the I, sex. How movie. young he looks! Like, shout out, he shout out, Gary Oldman. Out. Gary Oldman is a for real conservative, man. He he a for real right winger, man. I can't do nothing uh, to respect it. I, I'd say probably more libertarian. <laughs> uh, As I said, he a for real right winger, man. Um, you know. <laughs> I'm just saying, man. <laughs> I think my, just favorite, my favorite Gary Oldman performance. My favorite Gary Oldman performance is uh is True Romance, where they have yes. him dressed up like fucking riff raff, you know, with the with the fucking gold teeth and the um or like the silver teeth and the fucking dreads. They have him come in as like a fucking drug dealer in the middle of Ga that movie. Gary Oldman in True Romance is cold cash now, but without the dreads. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's up. <laughs> See what I'm saying? That's what's up. So, and also, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Sid and Nancy is, is where Gary Oldman came to a lot of people's attention. Mm -hmm. That's what made him a movie star. Hell yeah. And he didn't even have like a deep affinity for punk rock at all. He didn't like nope. punk rock music or uh, Sid Vicious specifically or anything along those lines. He was just like, oh, this will be an interesting role. And in yeah, fact, he like malnourished himself. He like malnourished himself to the point of like, I think he almost like passed out or something, had to be hospitalized. Uh, just to kind of like look the part of this like yeah. emaciated dude, which let's be clear, Sid Vicious was like that before he ever got hooked on heroin. He was like yeah. just an unhealthy, skinny kid, real naive too, to the but point the that I want to point that uh, uh, out that a lot of this stuff, a lot of what we think of with the UK punk, came from a provocateur perspective. If it pissed mm -hmm. off the right people, it was worth doing. It wasn't like, hey, I'm gonna wear this insignia, and that means I know what this is. And that I know like what this means to people and that I believe all these things. It was, oh, this pisses off all these Tory assholes who I hate and want to, to hate me. And it was all just as childish as that. Like, like it's, you know, 12 year old kind of mindset. And that isn't to like excuse anything, but it's really easy for us here in 2021 to be like, oh man, that's foolish. And it is, but that's the only way they could express themselves. There was no other way to, get that kind of message out. And I think Alex Cox has gone on record as saying that he felt the entire punk movement kind of betrayed its values by just being uh, sort of absorbed Borg-like into the overall music establishment and the line becomes safe. All right. So, so here's, here's a perfect transition into, um, this is an Alex Cox clip. Um, it's a little okay, low volume. You, you play the clip. Lean in a little bit to, to hear it. But, um, so this is this is Alex Cox talking about why he feels like the movement failed and why he feels like um, uh, specifically also this movie failed and it's kind of for a similar reason. So I thought this this was really interesting. But it's okay, a little but of so, course, before you yeah. play the clip, I just want to say I take back the whole Gary Oldman libertarian thing. So not to piss anybody All right, off. Just, whatever, it doesn't matter. Just play the clip. <laughs> you're not you're not you're not you're not, you're not, pissing, you're not pissing me off. I'm just a hater, man. <laughs> you know, you you good, man. I'm just I, I I'm just a hating ass nigga, man. There's nothing else to it. <laughs> <laughs> More than a rumor, there was a plan by the studios. The studios, for some reason, were very keen to promote the career of Madonna. Then as now, for some reason, you know, Madonna's a film director now, right? Um, so, for some reason, a, a film had already been greenlit by the studio uh, to star Madonna, Rupert Everett, as Sid Liz, Sid. And so we really got into it just to stop that. <laughs> That's really what happened. It's like, it's the thought of it. There's a thought of the whole punk movement. It's not meant, Sid Vicious, this film is not meant as an example of a perfect punk and the movement should have gone. I mean, the scene where, where Cy Richardson, who plays the methadone dispenser, tells them, you guys are completely betrayed by this person who's involved in you know. That was the point of the film. And it doesn't come across. The film fails. The film fails. Um, but that was still our intention. And yet we fall into this trap, um, which, you know, Donald Ritchie? You know who Donald Ritchie is? 
very important independent filmmaker. He wrote the biography of, of Kurosawa. Uh, he was Kurosawa's friend. Kurosawa's closest Western friend. Um, and Don Ritchie, when we were talking to him about um, Kurosawa's film, and about Kurosawa's last film, Manadayo, um, what uh, Don Ritchie said about Manadayo is it's sentimentality. Sentimentality is unearned emotion. And that's the problem with this book. Is it's unearned emotion. It gives you like all of this kind of ironic and sentimental stuff, like the big cake that you can eat and go and watch you and like, oh yeah, you know. But really it's very sentimental. And uh, 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 for me, a very unsuccessful thing. My experience with punk rock movement was in Los Angeles. Because I went to the States in 77, 78. And so I missed, I mean, I was at film school in Bristol in England in 76, 77. So I was aware of the, uh, the punk rock movement because we had a band in Bristol called the Cortinas. And I saw a guy in 1976 or 77 walking down the street with 1977 written on his back. And I thought that was really important. I thought they were onto something at the point. So because of that, and then later on I heard Pretty Vacant and I heard the Sex Pistols. But I viewed it as, as I think, Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood and Joe Strummer and John Lydon, I think they all viewed it as a revolutionary movement which was supposed to break down the government and create a new and radical and improved regime in the same way as Umal and Dali in the early days of the surrealist movement thought that, that was what that was all about. And in both cases, it turned into just a way of selling product, making money, you know. And uh, so in that sense, just as Buñuel says in his autobiography, you know, our intentions were excellent, but we entirely failed. Yeah, sorry that, that the volume on that was so low, but uh, I tried to I tried to raise it and the like the static from behind him kind of overwhelmed the <laughs> you know, anything that he was saying. But basically, you know, he's talking about how he believes the punk movement failed and how he failed at making this film because obviously this film is kind of a, a sentimental version of the story, which, I mean, I think is really true. It's kind of, uh, there's tons of sentimentality. It's treating all of the characters kind of a lot more, um, I, with a lot more nostalgia, I think, than they're meant to be uh, looked at. Although I think that at the same time, maybe not as much as he feels like it does because it kind of covers them in bodily bodily fluids. Like, you know, it kind of it shows them at their worst. Like, I, so I, I don't necessarily think that maybe, I think maybe he's being a little bit too hard on himself, but I think the point stands that he's trying to show that, you know, this is not something to emulate. It's something that failed. And that scene with Cy Richardson where he says, um, you know, you guys could be selling healthy anarchy. Uh, really, I think <laughs> is the point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he thought it was a cartoon. He thought it was in danger of like, just through like the... Which you got to remember, this is the 80s, right? So the idea of nostalgia as like a permanent thing that is even considered weird wasn't a thing yet. So he didn't want that to be fetishized because he saw it as, as said, a failure. It didn't do what it was supposed to do. And it became a lot of things that they railed against. And he considered that with filmmaking as, as well as with the music. You know, whether he was right or not, you know, whatever. I mean, you had Malcolm McLaren that he's given credit to this day for making them as like the first boy band, whatever bullshit people keep spouting out that Malcolm McLaren himself said. Whereas in reality, that dude is a shameless opportunist and a heartless manipulator. Hold on. Can I go back? Can I just ask a question real quick? Can I just ask a question? You said the first boy band? That, like he that's, said that? Yes. Because that, that's. So someone else can, I mean, I can. No, no, no. The reason why I'm asking is because this is, you know, I've been smoking way too much, but um, the, the first, you wouldn't call it a boy band, but the first group to really embody that would be New Edition. So I, I never Frankie heard Valley. of, I never heard of, um, you the know, pointing, <laughs> them pointing to anyone else because that whole formula for New Kids on the Block is just a, a white New Edition. And so well, I'm surprised I mean, anybody would make that claim. Well, well, let's oh, jump back to the, the like, for years, for years. Really? For yeah, it's, that's stupid. Why I, it's dumb and it needs to die. And it doesn't pass. I, I, I agree. Of scrutiny. I, I mean, I, I mean, like, like you could argue that Frankie Valley and the four seasons were the first boy band. I, I will, I will, um, I will argue that 
But I, I can also say, like, if you want to say it's the monkeys, fine. You know, we can say it's the monkeys. I, I'm only talking about in today's sense of yeah. Like, well, well, that's because yeah. like like Jackson Five was a boy band. Technically, um, yeah. Like, it, put I together mean, the, for mercantile insane. function. You know, like put together in such a way that it was. Uh, <laughs> hey, we are going to make a successful pop act to sell some records, get some money, and we're going to just make these kids be whatever we need them to be. You know, like Menudo style. I guess it's Menudo too, right? I will, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I will yeah, say that, that Cox, Cox thought that that the Sex Pistols were a fake punk band, even from the failure of the charge. He he leveled that punk. He had particular animus towards the Sex Pistols. Yeah. Um, and like Leiden's uh, anger at Cox, I think is somewhat justified actually for a couple of reasons, but like, it's pretty clear that, uh, Cox didn't like John Leiden and didn't like the band oh. and, and, and like the actor that they have playing John Leiden is, is really awful. <laughs> um, and, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a super unsympathetic uh, portrait. And it's one of the few times where you'll hear me like side with John Lydon. Cause I tend to not like, like him myself, but it's, it's uh, it, it, it is kind of interesting how unsympathetic it is. The, the, the reason uh, a little bit of backstory on the reason why Sid might be portrayed somewhat sympathetically and why stuff like the suicide pack, which Cox just makes up um, is part of this is that in initially this movie was being sued by Savicious's mother, um, Ann Beverly, who uh, the, the whole another story on that, but uh, um, Beverly didn't she's want the movie credited, to credit it though, she's credited as an advisor on the film. Well, this is that. this is it. Um, she met with Alex Cox and there were a few changes to the script <laughs> that were not discussed and I've never found what they were. And the tone of Ann Beverly completely changed. And so she went from trying to su sue Alice Cox uh, under UK libel law to totally backing and advising the, the movie and also being like one of the only sources of direct information that apparently Cox had um, because Nancy Sponge's family refused to cooperate and John Lydon, according to him, didn't cooperate. According to Cox, did a little bit. Um, their stories on what happened conflict. Um, but I just bring it up because it, it, it is interesting to me um, that element of it. And it also does soften um, a lot of what we know about Sid Vicious um, at, somewhat at the expense of the other members of the band. Yeah. Um. Well, I guess Alex Cox claims also, though, that, uh, you know, uh, John Lydon actually did kind of approve of the film at the time. And actually, the, the actor that they had playing him, he actually, the actor followed him around for a full day, went clubbing with him at one point, and uh, it, it ended up like, you know, and then at the last minute, he turned around and said, oh, I don't approve of this film, and then tried to sue them, um, which, which, is, which is interesting. But at the same time, there's a really funny uh, interview that Alex Cox did for the 30th anniversary of it. Where he's like, there couldn't have been a better, um, better promotion for us doing this film uh, than John Lydon coming out and being like, "Oh, fuck this film! Nobody should see this. I don't want this film made." Because of course, at that point, everyone's like, "Oh, John Lydon doesn't want you to see this movie. I should definitely see this movie. Like, this is the movie that must be getting so close to the truth that he's embarrassed about it, or like, you know, that that he doesn't want it to be seen. It's embarrassing for him." So it kind of um, Alex Cox thinks that that's like one of the big reasons that the movie did so well at the time. Well, I mean, John Lydon was kind of like the Kanye West of his time in that way, you know, just mercurial, deeply hard to understand, does his own thing and is like, knows how to work the media in his own way. And it's usually by being kind of a prick. Yeah. Also, so, I guess I got to agree the whole movie. He, Alice Cox has a deep contempt for the entire subject matter. So it's amazing that it works th as it does, because it's almost like transparently contemptuous. Are you saying that uh, Kanye is going to be on Judge Judy? One can hope. I'll watch. Yeah, yeah no, that, that the John Lydon. You won't watch is, that. Uh, <laughs> I would watch that, and and I'm going to rewatch the John Lydon episode of Judge Judy because that was great. <laughs> um. So I, I was going to set uh I was going to set Conan up to go through the whole Malcolm McLaren thing. Um. 
I have a uh, from from the the documentary um, that that they did after the fact. I have a, a bunch of stuff on uh, how John Lydon exploited them, and you can see that in the movie. Obviously, they're on the boat. They don't make a big deal out of it, but um, but Sid Vicious is asking for money and saying, "Oh, I need a little bit of money." And he's like, "But as a sex pistol, we give you everything you need. You have you have food. You have." drugs you have like or not drugs but like alcohol like they're on that boat they're partying so um I, I think that this is something to set up uh conan's conan's beef of the day i mean last time uh it was hans zimmer but this time it's uh <laughs> <laughs> this time it's uh it's malcolm mclaren so let's let i mean you know this is this is a recurring this is a recurring segment i'd say we were musicians we didn't want to make a film Malcolm was very good at spending other people's money. There was a lot of being put into the film from the band's royalties, which we didn't know about. And then we got to, like, like I said, San Francisco, and Malcolm's in town, and Sid goes off with Malcolm. Suddenly, Sid comes back smacked up. Winterland, the final countdown. It wasn't a rock and roll party. Was more like a dying horse that needed putting out of its misery. It's not really impossible in San Francisco to have monitors that work. Is it? Is it impossible to have a sound check? No. Is the iPhone Malcolm will set it up to look ridiculous. We're all cheated, audience, and lead singer alike. You'll get one number and one number only, because I'm a lazy bastard. You have to understand, they stayed in a very nice hotel. This is no fun. Me and Sid were not allowed in that very nice hotel. We had to stay with the road crew in a motel. The sheer lack of respect when we rang for Malcolm and him not returning a call. That was it for me. It wasn't connived at all. We got to our hotel and booked in there. I wasn't aware that we can get a room there, you know, so we ended up staying somewhere else. Now, fun, my baby. Now, fun, my Malcolm was fucking with me. I had no credit card, no money, no ticket. He was trying to wreck the very thing that made the sex pistols grow. And he managed to achieve it that night. Yeah. So <laughs> Malcolm McLaren, man, that, that man is like one part Colonel Tom Parker, one part PT Barnum. I mean, like I said, uh shameless opportunist. He saw opportunity with punk uh, and a heartless manipulator. He didn't care about the guys who were a band previously existing with Glenn Matlock playing bass, I might add. Right. Um, and he set them up for failure. He did things like he booked them when they finally got to the U S they played New York and the place San Francisco. And he booked them in the deep South in places that he knew their lives would be in danger. He hooked Sid vicious up with heroin when he knew that that was going to be a problem. Like that guy. Yeah, that was, that was, that's what they were implying. I think in that, uh, in that explanation, right. Um, you know, they're saying, oh, yeah. he disappears from Malcolm for a few hours. He finally gets into town. And, uh, and and you know, all of a sudden, you know, he has a bunch of heroin and he's smacked up and he comes on stage. For, it's for a, it's, so yeah. it sounded like, sound like Birdman. <laughs> Straight <laughs> up. I know. I understand the reference he's making, but that's Birdman to the yeah, T. You got you to gotta take the hands. Oh, yeah. Birdman. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> You know, when I think of Birdman, I'm like, what contract, boy? A contract can be recontracted. You know? Well, but that's just it. It's like he this dude took advantage of these of these guys. They didn't yeah, they didn't know yeah. any better. They didn't have anyone looking out for him the entire time. And and I think not Sid and Nancy, but the story of the Sex Pistols is really important for anyone involved in music, such as I am. I know you, I know you felt yeah, this hour. Exactly. Wow. And that's why I wanted to bring you in uh, on this part of the conversation, because I think the exploitation piece of it is incredibly yeah. important, not just in music, but like across um, every creative industry. Mm -hmm. but I, I will say, in, in, in Malcolm's defense, his album is actually pretty good. 
<laughs> wait, 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 it's crooning, right? Is that, is he made a crooning record. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was like like a post punk kind of whatever. It's, it's not bad. Look, you, that you, dude. You know. If, the, if that dude in today's time would be like like what the my pillow guy is for Trump, he'd be that kind of asshole. Yes. He'd be like this fucking prick. That's Wait, but hold on, hold on, hold up though, because he's on he's on some crackhead shit right now because he accused True News and Rick Wiles, those super right wing anti Semitic cats, of having been in, infiltrated by Antifa. Like, yo, you can't. Oh, you're talking you, about the, the my pillow guy. Yeah, you can't shit on like your other crazy folks, man. That's some crackhead <laughs> shit, man. That's some straight yeah, up crazy crackhead shit. Yeah, because yeah. like it's like you guys understand. There's a difference between a crack smoker and a crackhead. A crack smoker is just gonna do their thing and keep it on the low. These things exist, but a crackhead, even without crack, my Mike Lindell is still gonna be a piece of shit. That's just what he is, you know. Well, so I think, I think you did see this movie. You took away the big. You took away yeah. the big, uh, the big, the big takeaway. There's a difference between a crack smoker and a crack. I, I don't think there's any other takeaway to this movie. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just, I'm just being honest. I'm Effie. If you could weigh in and please, you know, elaborate maybe to, to your knowledge of what I'm saying about a crackhead and a crack smoker. What I'm saying is that Malcolm McDowell never created an incredibly comfortable pillow, though. So let's keep it a buck. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. one thing he didn't do. So, that's real you know, talk. I mean, it's not a fair comparison. <laughs> that's real talk. <laughs> I mean, but my pillow never put out a, uh, out a good album, so you know. There's that. <laughs> I, I mean, Malcolm McLaurin didn't just do it. Didn't just do it to the Sex Pistols either. I mean, he did it no. to Bongo. He did it. He, I mean, he did it over and over. And I mean, with Ongo Bongo, you're dealing with like a a teenage immigrant girl um, that gets him pulled into this. Um, but I mean, it is pretty clear to me that like th that part of the story of Sid Vicious is deliberately destroying, letting someone destroy themselves as part of a publicity gimmick. Um, 100%. Spectacle. Oh, yeah, 100%. spectacle. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, but and, that and, goes back to even the, the freak show promoters of the fucking 1900s and shit. Like, you know, janky yeah. promoters and managers have been around. I'm sure, you know, fucking... Back in the uh, caveman days, there was one kid around <laughs> fucking having the caveman fuck all the guys and shit. That that shit's that that's 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 the true oldest profession. Because even that's prostitutes had janky promoters fucking pimping them. So that's the true oldest profession in owners. Yeah. No, as long as as long as there's been, you know, um performers and showmen and everything else, there's always right. been like the, the, exploiting the, them. I mean, Car yeah, the, the carnival barker, I think, is a great example because even in this movie, the first time you see Malcolm McLaren, he's in front of that sex shop and he's like, uh, step on up. You know what yeah, I mean? yeah. Like, yeah. I like, think what they call that, that guy, but yeah. he's doing that. He's like get, trying to get him in, you know, to get him in the door. Shows you what kind of dude he is. And he yeah. always was. And it's kind of, I mean, it's also kind of Trumpian in a way because, you know, I think he's someone that, not, not Trumpian in the sense of like 2016 presidential Trump, but like, 1980s Trump, where it's this tabloid relationship where, you know, as a famous person, all press is good press, and you get yourself on, on the front of the tabloids, and all of a sudden everybody's talking about how you're in decline, and everyone's talking about kind of all the stuff about your relationship, and this is seen as, like, some form of, you know, you're in you're in the papers, and that it seems to be that, that kind of, like, exploiting drama and exploiting actual decline for, uh, for newspaper headlines seems to be something that Malcolm McLaren did very well, um, you know, and to this day, we still repeat the frames that he created about what he allegedly did. That's how powerful and how good he was at slinging that bullshit. Yeah, ag agreed. Uh, I said uh, Ungo Bungo, I meant Bow Wow Wow, but he did it to multiple bands and he he got away with it. Like over I was going to say, again. not if, if Ungo Boingo was out today and they came out with that little girl song, the niggas would be like, <laughs> they, would, they, they, they would be. They would be a QAnon like front and center, bro. Like real yeah. talk. Hit the brakes, Danny Elfman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bongo, Bongo <laughs> does have that pedophile. Bongo, Bongo and Bongo. Yeah. Come on, dude. That's I read that the. What what what'd you say, Ev? That how do you how do you confuse Oingo Boingo with Bow Wow Wow? Come on. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what come on, man. Alliteration? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Bow Wow Wow. That was nothing. He was. Uh, oh, sorry, Forrest. I was just saying he was. No, I didn't. I didn't want to. Um, I didn't want to bring up the Mike Lindell thing too much. But my favorite, my favorite grift from the end of the Trump presidency was when uh, the the kid, the kid that was in um, the kid that was in the Parkland shooting. Um, I always forget his name. Wanted to make a liberal pillow to compete with uh, Mike Lindell's 
my pillow oh, company. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think that was I think that was the best grip uh, grift of the Trump era because you know like I, I I don't know I don't think anything culminates like the the liberal liberal response to the Trump presidency better than someone just being that's like, the well, soft shit I'm talking about Cole you, you get what I'm saying like that's the that's the soft shit I'm talking about the liberal response is to make a competing pillow yeah we're gonna get him we're gonna get I him mean, I mean <laughs> F F you, you know you know F that we I don't fuck with liberals like that I don't really associate with liberals like that. Any and all liberal criticism is warranted, justified, and understood. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and 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 what was it? David Hogg, he got roasted for that, and rightfully so. It's the perfect, perfect, perfect um statement about liberal bullshit, which is nah, man. Let me come with my competing, but it's better, you know. Like, no, 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 just, nigga. Just putting a syringe right into the culture war, right? Like just exactly. You know, and, and so your, your response isn't to make some kind of class. And, and, and like, other than that, David Hogg is all right to me, you know, he's all right yeah. kid, but, but no man, like somebody had to get his ear. Like, no, bro, you're not going, you're not going to beat the, my pillow guy at the, my pillow game, bro. He, I mean, yeah, you got to smoke way more crack for that. But I mean, the thing is like, that guy's also a kid. He's a kid, you know, yeah, so it's like, yeah. got some dumbass idea like that. Right. No one's going to tell him no. And then, then it's, you know, later on, he's gonna be like, "Wow, remember when I tried to do that? That was stupid." But you know, whatever. It's yeah. he's a Twitter star. Yeah. My, pillow, so. my pillows weren't even that good. You know, <laughs> what's this memory gotta, foam, right? There's got to be a. There's got to be the communist uh, response to that, which is our pillow, and it's just a. It's just <laughs> well, the, the, the communist <laughs> response was the bamboo pillow, and that shit is fire. <laughs> fire. <laughs> it's a good pillow, man. Really? Good, damn good pillow. Yeah, they're comfortable. Can't lie, good pillow. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, this 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 joint is two hundred forty nine bucks. What? <laughs> oh shit! If I go to Wayfair, I can get one for forty eight. Okay, that's cool. Not, that's that's not good. Good. Yeah, for that kind of money, there better be other services rendered. You know what I mean? <laughs> There's oh, cocaine the, inside the. Uh, it's forty eight Canadian. It's forty eight Canadian. No, I be forgetting. <laughs> My All right, bag, so guys. bringing it bringing it back to the you know uh, Sid and Nancy as a movie. Um, oh, yeah, I think we got off track a little. Out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like how this is the time that I kind of scheduled it out and was like, "All right, here's the things I want to talk about," and we're so far off track at this point. Um, so I had the Roger Deakins clip where he's talking about actually shooting the movie, and uh, Roger Deakins is you know really just just a, a, a film icon. Um, Damn man, the guy's you know, awesome. He, he works with, uh, you know, his, his work with the Coen brothers is amazing. His work with just, you know, director after director is really amazing. But um, I, I think it's interesting where he talks here about uh, the way that this movie was shot. Um, obviously, it's not in a way that you can really shoot movies today because everybody's kind of worried about, you know, being sued. Everyone's kind of worried about um, exploitation in a different way, you know, where you have to kind of schedule things out for the studios in a perfect way. So it's interesting to hear him talk about how these kind of informal shoots are something that he wishes would uh, come back. And started off thinking uh, we were going to shoot it in a certain way, which was quite composed and sort of structured. And that went right out of the window. I mean, eventually I just sort of put the camera on my shoulder and said, that's it. this is the only way we can really make this work. You know, because because so much was done on the fly, and and uh, because it was that kind of project, so it was quite it was quite exciting in that way, really. You know, kind of living on the edge in a way, and making it up and hoping it was going to work from moment to moment. You know, I mean, there was a lot of research into the look and the, the you know the history of it, which wasn't that old. You know, um, and Alex was very. Um, you know, very careful that we chose the location and everything that really reflected those mo that moment in time. Um, but, you know, when I said we made things up on the fly, it was like that's the way the actors worked and that, well, Alex wanted to work with it, so it felt very spontaneous and immediate. You know, it, it wasn't, in that sense, it wasn't something that was very sort of static and controlled. It was funny watching the film yesterday because we were you know, <laughs> time. And thinking about you know being on the on the uh, on the river there in the boat, and it was like the <laughs> pistols were at this boat party, and, uh, <laughs> and it was chaotic. And the idea was the police come and shut it down, 
while the police really came and shut us down, you know. I mean, the boats coming alongside were, were kind of real. <laughs> and it was like really kind of funny. Um, a lot of it we did on the fly, frankly. I mean, but it was more like that in those days. I mean, I shot a number of films where we did things without permission, you know, like blowing up a Rolls Royce in the east end of London in the middle of the night. And then... <laughs> packing and running as quick as we could as the police sirens were being, you know, heard in the distance. I mean, it was sort of you know, crazy, but you did it. I, mean, I don't think you'd even entertain doing that now, not on a, not on a movie. Abby, Will, the writer, and, and Alex and myself would go to work together. And Abby was saying, you know, I really think when they're in the alley kissing, we want, we want trash falling on them. You know, they've got to be, there's got to be something surreal about it and I said well you know you mean trash bins and yeah they said yeah with trash bins falling I said well that's going to look a bit weird if they kind of trash bins are going through frame going <laughs> you know so I think I said well but if we shot it at high speed or maybe Alex said what do we shoot at high speed oh yeah oh we got to get a high speed camera so we're in this alley and the guys are finding trash bins from down the street and <laughs> taking them up into the roof throwing them off we've got this camera which turned up about an hour and a half later from one of the rental companies but it kept jamming so you know our turnover the trash is falling down the camera would run at 120 frames and then jam completely and I'm thinking this is my first time shooting in the states I'm thinking here I am in Hollywood and the camera doesn't even run it was very weird so eventually we got a take that was you know Tens, well, whatever it was, thirty feet long or something. It was long enough for the shot, and that was that was it. Really, we were actually lucky to get the shot because the camera was screwing up so much. But it was, it was just something that was like talked about in the car going to work, and like, yeah, oh, let's do it at high speed so it's more poetic. Okay, trash bins. It was kind of funny, but it was that kind of shoot. There's a long dialogue scene going across the bay and on the Bay Bridge in San Francisco. And I always remember that because I'm just sitting at lunch having a pretty hard day's shoot. And Alex says, uh, can we go and shoot something? I said, well, yeah, now it's lunch. He said, no, no, I just need to do a little shot in, a, in the car. Uh, oh, okay. Um, on the way to, we were uh, somewhere else in San Francisco. So we get in this car with a camera, just me and a couple of magazines. Sound record is hiding in the bottom of the, or something and um, we drive across the bay bridge <laughs> alex writes the dialogue as we get to the start of the bridge <laughs> gives it <to laughs> i thought we were shooting like two minutes of dialogue driving across this bridge just like three of us in this car <laughs> oh, it was kind of that it was crazy but it's in the film it's a great little piece you know <laughs> it's kind of fun i wish we did more of that now you know but it's like a lot of the films you do it's like two pre-thought in a way, you know what I mean? I totally want to party with Roger Deakins. Yeah. No, I, so we've done, so far we've done, um, you know, an abundance of uh, Alex Cox movies. We've done Repo Man, we did Walker, we kind of uh, brought up kind of straight to hell within that. And uh, I, I think it's interesting to have Roger Deakins obviously filming this. It's kind of the one big Alex Cox movie that's like a mainstream Hollywood film. And obviously the shoot is like as crazy as and, and like kind of almost like punk in a weird way as, as you think it would be. And it's really funny that someone like as respectable now as Roger Deakins um, is looking back on it being like, oh, that was so fun. I wish I did more stuff like that. Yeah. Um, the, the dude who yeah. did like Big Lebowski and No Country for Old Men and Shawshank Redemption, like all, you know, like it's classic movies. And he's like, oh, man, that was badass when we, you know, dump garbage on these guys. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he got his Oscar finally for uh, Blade Runner, to, uh, you know, uh, right? like, Yeah, was, yeah, the one, uh, yeah. the, the uh, Denise Villanueva, is that you say that dude's name? I still don't know. Did I mispronounce it last time? I don't know. Whatever. The, the new one. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, but like, you know, that kind of sci-fi, um, you know, big, big blockbuster movie, really, you know, the way that they film it, like the, the way that they plan it out, like these studios now won't let you go over budget. You know what I mean? Like everything has to be so well uh, categorized. Like you need to get permits no matter um, where you film. You know what I mean? Like, so there's all these different regulations. They're so afraid of being sued. They're so afraid that if you shoot somewhere, someone's gonna like, you know, demand some kind of credit. Someone's gonna demand 
you know, sue the studio, tell you you can't do that. Like, so, you know, the way that films, I mean, he's right. The way the films are shot now is so pre-planned and so uh, set in stone and scheduled. It's kind of, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, it's like adorable to watch him think about how, you know, one time they were running around a city and just like jumped in a car and started, you know, recording something that somebody wrote, you know, 10 seconds before that, which I, I think that Alex Cox was probably still maybe doing a little of the speed, but, you know. Well, far as far as you got to remember doing cowboy shit and doing gangster shit when you're used to like living this bureaucratic life and like following these rules of Hollywood is fun. So if you get to do a film that's on some cowboy wild, we're going to do whatever the fuck we want, guerrilla style shit. It's fun, so it makes sense for him yeah. to look back like, damn, I wish I could have more fun like that, you know? No, I, no, it 100% makes sense. I, just as someone who uh, I, I respect Roger Deakins a lot, um, like, you know, he's, he's always kind of very proper now when, they, when they, they bring him out. He's like, this is how a filmmaker really, and so it's, it's just, you know, it's kind of like adorable to see him reminiscing on like this one, this one straight up cowboy film shoot that they did, where they're just running around a city and like to watch him just be like, I wish I could do more things like that. It's like, well, you know, I mean, they, it's like... <laughs> they, they do still make movies like that. I, I mean, Under Her Skin uh, with uh, the, the Scarlett Johansson movie. Oh, yeah, that was, good. Um, that was really that good. Was, yeah. was, all those guys she picked up in the movie, those were just people around Scotland. Uh, you know, she, uh, Scar, Scar Jo would just hop in her car, ride around, pick up some dude. And if, 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 if he went with her, the, the, they'd pull over, sign a deal with the, the guy on the spot, and then melt him into goo. <laughs> if they went with her, Scarlett Johansson's rolling up. Yeah. And like, nah, I'm good. Yeah, this is what I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah. Scar Joe. I'm not getting in that car. I know where this leads. I've seen Get Out. I'll, <laughs> I'll wait for Megan Fox. That's the next one, right? <laughs> <laughs> I no, but I they make movies like that. Also, you know, there's independent filmmaking that's you know really just everywhere right. now. I mean, so I'm not saying that this isn't. Uh, done like that, but it, it is interesting because they yeah, did but have... you're not going to get Roger Deakins to come in on on some yeah. like little yeah. indie film, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, like I, I, I said, 1917. Was... He was the best thing about 1917 too, because that movie was beautiful. Like that's pretty much all it had going for it, but it's beautiful. <laughs> it looked cool. Look cool as shit. At the same time, though, it's kind of funny to see uh, Alex Cox complaining about how much studio interference he had throughout this movie and the, the ending he said is a complete failure. Um, the ending was a complete failure because he, he thought that, you know, we should have done something way more graphic, but then the studio probably wouldn't have picked it up and we should have ended it on a bad note. You know what I mean? So it's interesting to see. Um, uh, it, it's very interesting to see, um, you know, Alex Cox complaining about studio interference while Ro Roger Deakins is like, Oh, we, we didn't have any studio interference compared to what we have now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he doesn't have the story straight, right? He's like, no, man. No, no, you're supposed to say they interfered. <laughs> <laughs> um, I so Alex Cox, uh, I was listening to he has a podcast now. Um he, he has a Who podcast doesn't? that he does yeah, but he does out of uh out of IFC, like the International mm -hmm. Film Film Festival out of uh Boulder. And so I was listening to a bunch of the episodes that he did yesterday. And um, honestly, really incredible. Most impressive thing about it is that they get their episodes done in, in, in 20 minutes, which, Whoa. you know, this this show, this show struggles with getting their episodes done in two hours. So uh, <laughs> I thought that was a really amazing part of it. But um, no, so I it, it's very interesting to see how many films Alex Cox has actually watched and, and how interested he is in filmmaking after being blacklisted. I mean, this is kind of our... This is kind of our continuation of this because obviously we talked about his blacklisting when we did the Walker episode a couple of weeks ago. Um, so his his continuation, um, the continuation is that you know after after uh, that film, after being blacklisted, he still does indie films, but uh, he started as a as a film professor in Boulder, Colorado, and um, he he wrote actually like a film textbook, and like that's what he does now for his like main gig. It's like he teaches people how to do filmmaking. Which I think is interesting because he's such a renegade at this point, yeah. and you know, even even his version of like a Hollywood film, like you can see um, exactly why uh, you see exactly why you know he kind of ended up getting blacklisted on top of the political aspects of it. I think. I mean, I think like in a way, you know, he hit different in a way that people didn't like, as opposed to like a Robert Rodriguez or someone that 
you know, definitely did it their own way, but did it in such a way that it was easily translatable. And you say he did it my way. <laughs> That's a great moment in this movie, by the way. I forgot how rad that version is. Like, mm-hmm. I was like, because even though everything that's happened, like all this reprehensible junky bullshit's going on, all this stuff that, like, it's just like, oh, it just gets horrible and horrible and worse and worse. It does that, and you're like, fuck yeah, you did. Yeah, you get it, man. That's awesome. Like, it's hard not to get stoked about it. Like, but it's so well shot because then you're like, oh, yeah, they're back to the Chelsea. And then like, oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Murder and d- depression. And OK, OK. Yeah, sure. Well, they have this they have this obsession throughout the movie with this kind of I mean, and I think they did in real life. They have this obsession with like the cowboy Western uh, lifestyle, which they get to America. They've been so bored living through this imperial decline, which is kind of the thing that I was, you know, referencing in the beginning of this. That They're kind of on their like this. This is the cowboy country. Like we're in the U.S. finally. So they're, you know, they're dressed up as cowboys on top of these hotels and they're just shooting at, at, at people and like, you know what I mean, with fake guns and like, you know, and, and even even before that, I think in England, they're kind of obsessed with this. So they have this kind of uh, this, this, I guess, um, independence obsession, kind of almost like um, almost I mean, I don't want to say libertarian, but like th- this individualistic interpretation of things where they see their own position within the music industry as kind of uh, uh, creating like creating their own weird like. You know, just like Sid, Sid Vicious says it in, in interviews. And I think this is going to cue up the interview questions um, thing I wanted to do where they're answering questions um, after the Sex Pistols break up. But, um, you know, they're answering questions and they, they ask over and over again, like, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? And Sid Vicious is always like, I want to have fun. And, and I, I think that the movie doesn't necessarily capture this in the way that I wish it did. But they were like they were kids. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And they were acting up in the way kids do, and they were trying to like get into the kind of stuff that kids get into. But they also were these internationally renowned superstars that weren't given the infrastructure they needed to even you know support themselves emotionally, let alone financially. Yeah. And and it kind of led to, you know, it's one of the first uh I mean iterations of like obviously we, we were talking about boy bands, but like it is kind of the first one of the first iterations of these uh commercially commercially created i think um these commercially created groups that you know didn't necessarily uh have have a you know just they didn't necessarily have any of the infrastructure to really do what they were um supposed to do and uh were created by record labels ladies what is the scene for you why are you there Yours, yours, uh, Sid's manager, right? Yeah. Uh, what kind of role do you play in this? In what? What's your job? What have you, what have you been doing in this? I mean, you're part of, he's on stage performing, but you're just as much an active part of, uh, of the career as he is. What's your job? Okay. What are you manager. doing? What is that? Many people out in our audience don't have any idea what a manager does. I get getting gigs. Hey man, not everybody's in the record business. I, I'm as liaison to the record company. Um, Have you been I, able to sell him now? He's got four record contracts. I don't have to sell him. I mean, I, I arrange recording, I arrange gigs, I arrange the publicity, I talk to the club owners, to the um, the people at the record company, to the people in newspapers magazines, things like that. Are we ready, sir? Why don't we hear this cut, and then we can... I'd like to know some details about uh, the fight that, uh, that he had when uh, he and the Pistols jumped off the stage and joined in a brawl um, that was uh, happening right, right up front. It wasn't when in was the that? band then. It was not. You don't even know what he's talking about. What are you talking about, pal? Wait, no, you know, I, I read it in a book. Called, uh, Punk Rock 1988. I started it. <laughs> hey, it had, it had your picture and everything. Oh, you started that fight? Right, can I ask you about something else? Which, which well, let's find out time. about the fight. What was that fight all about? Um, yeah. Somebody started on a friend of mine, so I whacked him in the face with a belt. And yeah, but, did, did, did the whole band jump off the stage and join in? Yeah. yeah. Did you win? Of course we won. All right. How about how about that how about that girl who punched you in the nose in Texas? Did, did you really spit spit the blood back in her face? Of course. I I, I think that was that's great. I just wanted to congratulate it. Yeah, I am rather fine. Uh, yeah, that was fucking great. I loved it. 
Good night. He's taking okay, out so. the next week. Hello, you're live. Yeah, I'd like to know. Uh, my name is Shlomo, and uh, I'd like to know <laughs> where punk rock originated and uh, what's its purpose. Uh, In tip pickles. Uh, where does any music originate, and what's its purpose? Oh, you know, that's my question. I'm asking you. I mean, you're asking about what you know. You're asking these people. Where did it originate? Where did any music oh, originate? What's, all right, then what's and, the uh, function? And, and, what? What's the function of punk rock? Where did it come out? Why did it come out? It's because people are willing to pay music. and listen to it and it's enjoy it. Rock and roll is for listening to and dancing to. It's just to listen to and to dance to, like and any other kind of music is. Can you? All right, but why? Why is you know? You dress differently, you act differently. Why is this coming out in it? Is that just part of the business? It's just the way we are. We don't do anything for business. It's just what we're like. Well, where were you, you know, five years ago? I was pretty much the same as I am now. So all right, all. Why all of a sudden is it coming out now then? Because the, the public side. Just that you've on never us. seen us before. That's so now all. you see well, us. All right, then if I've never seen you before, why are you so covered up? Why were you in the background and now all of a sudden uh, evolving Maybe more out? people like us now. Who can tell? Okay. I, I, I think the answer to your question is if as long as change. people want to see Sid, he's going to be out there as long as he wants to be there. And as long as if there's no audience for him, he won't be there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand that. <coughs> I guess that pretty much answers my question. Okay, I'm Thank you now. very much. <coughs> Hello, you're alive. Hello. Uh, yeah. I'd like to ask Steve a question. Go ahead. First off, how is Johnny doing? Doing real he's good. A, he's a cunt. <laughs> he's not that. doing well at all. He's got a really terrible group. He's a real little faggot. He thinks, he thinks that gangsters are after him. He's really paranoid. He invents lies and things. He, he says people and, pull guns on him all the time. And he thinks the CIA... He's got a steel is door at home. It's a real pussy. Kidnapped. Okay, now you see not in for the money, but now you're, I'm sure, making quite a bit of money doing this. You're making a film. You have, you have four contracts. Uh, has things changed for you in that sense that you're into the money thing now? Even no, though you not in the least. It hasn't changed one iota. We and haven't seen much of the money anyway. Uh, you, you say you have something to say. Is it on a political level, or uh, are you? Are you yeah, turn on your TV just to drop. Okay, just hold on, just a half a second. On your television, sir. Okay. Uh, you say that you're not in it for the money. Of course, I. You, you said that before, but now, if the money comes, uh, is your statement musical, or is it? Uh, it's purely yeah, I really musical. I don't know how, how far I can take this question. You're is asking, is he musical? saying something political or musical? Is right, that yeah, that's or about both? it. Right. Okay. Are you saying anything political or musical or both? Both, really. So I'm not, I'm not really interested in politics much. We're against certain things, though. Fascism, the National Front, Queen. It's basically English politics. It's, that's where it started. New York groups aren't very political at all. So they really have nothing to say as far as politics go. But it's a, a, a musical statement as well. It's okay. a new kind of music. Houston, you're on the air. <laughs> <laughs> that really that really is like the proto the proto podcast, right? Like you can just Yeah, kinda... you had the shrieking feedback for no reason. I mean like <laughs> you know. it's like a libertarian college to the majority report. Yeah. Like you just, but I, I like the fact that you can just kind of call in and uh, and be like, so what's the point of punk? Why like why is this something that people are listening to? And they have to like explain yeah, it yeah, for yeah. you. <laughs> Justify okay, the existence but, of your genre. My name is Shlomo. Okay, but where but where were you five years ago? Like the dude's the dude's fucking what like fifteen six? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but um, I think that I mean I think that does a good job putting it in context. Um, with you know how young number one they really are. Uh, uh, during the the you know during their their lives, like uh, Nancy didn't make it to twenty one, and uh, Sid I think was twenty one when he passed away. So I, I think that Alex Cox kind of um, within kind of uh, creating this as a statement um, kind of misses that point of it. Which obviously I think there's a reason that he misses the point of it, which is that it doesn't really um, go with his statement. You know what I mean? Like he's kind of using them as a symbol of something. 
where um, a lot of people that are older than him and really do have bad intentions are using him. But I, I think in a lot of ways, he's also, I mean, he's like a kid. He's a kid that had been put into the situation when, you know, economically everything's declining. And, uh, and, and, and given, I mean, he wasn't obviously given too much money to do that until the end when kind of uh, the Sex Pistols break up and his, his girlfriend takes over as manager. But like, you know, they're, they're given the ability to go all over the world and, and do these things without really anybody thinking about whether they're, you know, mature enough or um, have like the, you know, the, the, the mental faculties, I guess, to really be in the situation. Um, and without anybody looking over their shoulder to see like, hey, like maybe what you're doing is ridiculous and we need to kind of hold you back, not in the way of not giving them royalties, but in, just in the way of like, you know, Malcolm McLaren going to America and literally providing him with heroin. Like the, the person that's supposed to be uh, managing him at that point has kind of turned him into a spectacle. And I don't necessarily think that Alex Cox makes that point. I think his point uh, with this movie is that, you know, the, the complete failure of, uh, of, of the punk movement to um, make any any real um, any real change or any real you know he kind of he kind of lays it at their feet because they've given up their principles. But at the same time, I think he's kind of too young to have principles. Um, I mean, the Sid Vicious's story is actually really, I mean, really, really tragic, even more than this movie lets on. I mean, his background is he was raised by a junkie. Um, his mother dies in ninety six um, of a of of, a, of an overdose herself. The rumor is that the actual heroin overdose that he uh, that he dies of um, after he's arrested a second time for assaulting Patty Smith's brother um, while he's out on bail for this was by his mother. Um, so we're, we're talking about a person who not just doesn't have the role on is a kid. He's a kid that is from a background where this is probably the absolute worst thing you could do is just to drop them in with a whole lot of money and mm -hmm. just leave him there. Um, and, and Nancy Spurgeon's similar. I mean, she went to, she went to, uh, to what, uh, university of Colorado. And she, I mean, she was banned from a state, um, uh, for, for, um, basically antics because she too was sent off to college um comes from a much more kind of normy uh midwestern background and that actually is portrayed in the movie but um uh immediately kind of left alone with a bunch of drugs in the early 70s and gets swept up in that and it also uh you know um is running around trying to manage this as a 19 year old or 20 year old um Who's yeah. just come into a ton of money, um, and um, it's with a person who, I mean, another thing I love Ullman's performance, and he does. I mean, you forget it's Gary Ullman, you really do. However, um, even though they don't look that much alike, he does a great job. You know? Right? No, they don't look that much alike, and also somehow Ullman seems to get Sid Vicious more energy when he talks. Um, but. Uh, He's not like, well, I'm not young with you. But uh, Vicious's violence was actually known to be escalating at the time. Um, like, because of, probably for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, maybe untreated mental illness, maybe just being too strung out, uh, constant, you know, adren uh, adrenaline um, junkiness, all kinds of stuff was beginning to kick in. Um, and I, I actually, I'm, I'm kind of mad at this movie. You know, I love Alice Cox movies, but I'm kind of mad at this movie for th its romanticized ending. And I know he's not. I know that Cox isn't satisfied with the, with the I ending. Think it's more than it's more than him not being satisfied with it. He's taken the failure of this movie actually pretty fucking hard. He's been talking about it for thirty years on different, uh, different interview platforms. And mm -hmm. like, I, I think, I mean he kind of cops out of it because he says, Hey, I was such a young filmmaker at this point. The only thing that he'd really made is repo man. Uh, and you know, but he also had been to film school and everything, you know, like, so he was like, he was like, I, I just thought that, you know, if we didn't end it on this, in this way that studios wouldn't pick it up. And uh, a really funny quote that he has is, um, he says, maybe that would be for the better though. Like I, <laughs> the film I mean, it's, it's, it it's a love story about doom junkie. that's tangentially related to music. Right. It's not exactly screaming mainstream hit. It's just the fact that there was no representation of the Sex Pistols at the time. And there was, right or wrong, a lot, you know, in the same way, think of OJ. 
right? Think how everyone wanted to talk about, oh, did OJ do it? Did he not do it? That was sort of like, well, did Sid kill Nancy? You know, that kind of thing. And a lot of, actually, I feel very fair critiques of Sid and Nancy is that, like, the movie just kind of lays it out there. It's like, hey, this is what happened. And that became the only acceptable explanation for what happened in the same way that McLaren's frame for like him putting together the sex pistols as a boy band was because it was the only narrative out there. It was right. literally the only one. And the and death it, narrative it, is completely it, fictionalized. Like, uh, yep. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Not to put a final point on it. It was made up for the freaking movie. Like, <laughs> you know, I mean, like for real. And, and I don't know. I don't think that that can ever be discounted, but also we have to realize that like, this was pretty recent history at that mm -hmm. time. This wasn't like, you know, before our time like you know we're like hey you know some of us on this on this um uh, show were alive but we were like babies at the time and some of us weren't alive at all it was like no that was like a few years back that was, was like oh yeah remember years. when beyonce did the black panther thing at the super bowl it was like that far back yeah you know? no it was, it was like what like nine eight nine years like yeah. i mean kind of people make make the reference oh it was a decade later but it wasn't exactly a decade later because it was 1986 but yeah it's, you it know was... it's yeah. Eight years later, and it was written. Actually, it was written much closer to the events too. I mean, like uh, "Love Kills," and that's not even the original title. It's the second title. Um, I think I think Cox wrote the script in film school, so that would have been like eighty one, eighty two. So it would have been like still kind of in the super news. fresh, ripped from the yeah. headlines. Yeah, <laughs> that's not, that's not, I mean, what he what he claims is that, and he, he claimed it in that video we watched, is that he saw that there was a. Um, movie that madonna like the studios are going to make a madonna mm -hmm. um and rupert everett version of the story and he was like hey we have to stop this from happening and so that probably would have been a little bit after repo man well, so that probably it, been like... according to according to criterion he tells two stories one is that he wrote this immediately he wrote the script immediately in film school and then abandoned it and then he saw the madonna thing and was like no this can't this absolutely cannot be um and then the other, I've heard him just mention the Madonna story, but there the, apparently the script it was by him and had been floating around for a while. Um, but it also, I've never seen it, but I suspect there's been a lot of revisions to this script. Um, one, he he did he never seemed happy with the with the ending. Two, um, like I said, there were major changes made when Anne Beverly got involved. Um, and I don't know what they are. Like, I haven't been able to, like, go and, like, compare scripts or anything. It's time so... for another Alex Cox email. email. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in, in a way, again, I took away way different things from it as a grown-ass man who has a discography behind him and plays music as an adult rather than did as, like, a kid in high school who just wanted to know more about the Sex Pistols. And... The ending, which I remember just being kind of feeling like it was a nothing ending when I first saw it as a kid, I actually kind of dug because that's like, you know, he goes, you know, he, the kids are like, hey, Sid, dance with us. And I was like, oh, that's cool, because it shows that, like, again, throughout the whole movie, Cox has such a deep contempt for both of these you know junkies that, like, failed everyone, et cetera, et cetera. It's like they're also just human beings, too, that had all this tragic stuff befall them. And I some mean, of it kids. was by their own decision. They're kids. Yeah, I actually kids, think the. Kids. They're kids. The movie are they kids or are they mermaids? <laughs> oh, <God damn. laughs> um, I mean, but but like like the movie makes Nancy Spudgeon. Mark, to you have be... to wrangle. You have to wrangle him. Yeah. <laughs> the movie makes Nancy Spudgeon like out to be way more shrill than she comes off in the interviews I've seen uh, around her. Now I know she was like notoriously uh, drug addled, um, like that. It, that doesn't no one seems to remotely contest that but like when i i've seen several interviews when she's acting as sid's manager where she's very lucid and he's together not, and that, yeah yeah and, and not, they're not like deeply contemptible in every possible way like she's completely depicted <laughs> the entire time here yeah right and it's i mean hard, and it's hard to feel like they're deeply as contemptible i think as people thought they were um now at a time during the opioid crisis we're like, I mean, at least someone that's, I mean, I hate, you know, throwing the age thing out there, but like as someone who's like 26 and is, you know, grown up during the opioid crisis, like half the people I know are fucking strung out or have been strung out and have recovered from it. So the idea that like somehow this is some contemptible thing that only happens to like, oh, these like overprivileged uh, uh, stars is, is ridiculous. Like, 
you know, like as, as kind of our economic situation as a country has declined and as our opportunities have declined, which is kind of the point of why it happened to the Sex Pistols um, at that time, you know, as it's all declined, um, they've, they, they've, you know, people start turning to heroin and, you know, all of these different opioids as a way to, to cope with that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think a lot about I was actually thinking about the drug messaging in this movie and I put this movie like in the same category that I do like uh oh that Darren Aronofsky movie. I, I am not Requiem for a Dream Requiem for a Dream worst movie. Yeah. Which which is which is an Soul amazing draining, great. <laughs> an amazing gripping movie that's that's also fucking terrible as far as like its actual you know motivation and it does portray like th this idea that I mean, in some ways, it actually contributes to the opioid crisis in a way, because the the idea that like there's safe opioids and then there's heroin, the most contemptible and evil drug that will just you yeah, no, utterly your dream has 100 percent contributed to like the uh, the romantic mythology around drug addiction. Yeah. So is train spotting. And, and, and so is this movie. And it but it's ro romantic mythology that both. Uh, that is aimed at being basically like an edgy version of Nancy Reagan. Um, and I'm surprised Cox would try to pitch it that way. I mean, that actually does surprise me given a, I know how much drugs he did and B, like, um, or at least the people around him did, uh, but maybe we're being charitable. Um, and B, can't you guys he, just stick to speed? Right. Speed. <laughs> You'll be awake. You'll make movies. You get so much done. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, in the '80s, this is definitely in the '80s. This is definitely portrayed as like the anti-drug movie, and then in the '90s, it's romana it's romanticized as yeah. a movie, uh, you know, like the Romeo and Juliet of all the punks, uh, you know, particularly yeah. after um, all the comparisons come out with Courtney Love and uh, Kurt Cobain. Who's in the movie? Who, yeah, right, she's right. In the so movie. <laughs> yeah, who is in the movie? The correct, and, and just speaking to that point specifically, as someone who was in high school when Kurt killed himself, too, that like, yeah, that was a thing. That was a big deal. As well as the, it went did go from cautionary tale to like, yeah, but it is kind of romantic. I'm like, yeah, but they're fucking junkies too. You do you do realize that they're fucking junkies. Also, sidebar, and I just have to do this. Requiem for a Dream, written by Hubert Selby Jr., uh, actually came out in 1978. Now, granted, of course, most people do not know Cubby Selby Jr. And most people uh, came, the Aronofsky movie is how people came to know it. But uh, he, Last Exit of Brooklyn, all that stuff, like there was, a, there was a whole purveying of that type of subculture for many years, most notably embodied by William Burroughs, who was kind of the one yeah. junkie that was okay to like, even though he killed his yeah. wife, which is sort of like, all right, yeah, we're just going to blast past that, huh? Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, William tells he wrote that, but he wrote that good disconnected uh, poetry and those good. Yeah. Yeah. No, no he's, he, he's unappreciatedly a badass artist. I agree with that, but it's also like, Hey, y'all remember he, when he killed his wife, <laughs> cause I do, yeah. I do. And, Kind of weird. Yeah, yeah, he uh, got he got away with shooting her in the head and didn't even get like negligent yeah. homicide. <laughs> like, yeah, but anyway, like, all right. Um, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. and as, as, as a sidebar to the sidebar to the sidebar, a friend of mine used uh, in a great band used to run a, a bookstore in uh, Lawrence, Kansas, and William Burroughs apparently would always come in. And the two magazines he'd always pick up were Guns and Ammo and Cat Fancy. So there you go. That's your <laughs> yeah, bon mot for the day. He thought his cat was his dead was the soul of his dead ex wife. Um, <laughs> Seriously, not making that up. No, uh, I know. And it's yeah, that and that's Burroughs for you. But by the same token, I think it's onto something that like it went from cautionary tale to romantic to kind of back to being a cautionary tale again. Yeah. But then that's also because there's been more depictions of heroin use allowed within media, Requiem for a Dream and 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 others. Whereas at the time, you gotta realize there just wasn't anything like that. Like there was stuff alluded to, you alluded to, oh well, he has um you know, his predilections. More, like, is he talking about more. dudes or what? Heroin representation in the media. Where is it? Where is it? I, I just got done watching the Mayans, and one of the characters in the last season goes off on a uh, heroin bender. So, so I mean, you know, it's it's out there. You just got to look for it. I, w I mean, just like I, just I like love that I there's about, stuff like oh, just like what I say about heroin. It's out there, but you got to look for it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, like I love that there's stuff like train spotting that like kind of present it you know in such a way that it's not just like neutral it's like no i'm gonna shoot here's what it looks like when you're actually kicking heroin you know and it is not a good time and it doesn't look like a fun movie or like a good book 
And I don't know, like I, I've had people in my life that I have lost to drugs and opiates specifically, as I'm sure everyone has. And some of them were very talented musicians and others were just, you know, just people that I wish weren't dead. And it's, it's weird that like, we still have this kind of puritanical way about talking about that kind of thing where we just assume culturally that if we don't say anything about it, that it's kind of okay. And now it's just brought up as, Oh, it's the opiate crisis. Oh yeah. What crisis would that be? Do you want to explain how that came to pass? No, you don't because there's certain companies that have made billions upon billions of dollars pushing that shit. Yeah, for so of course, and have here. also rehabilitated and have also uh, rehabilitated their image during the COVID crisis, as yes. they've kind of become, um, as they've become the one, like one of the few providers of uh, COVID vaccines, which obviously objectively a good thing. But like companies like Pfizer have kind of been able to bury the whole connection to the opioid crisis, which has decimated lives across the country because all you know we're, we're sitting there like, oh my God, Pfizer, they've saved us from a from a pandemic. Yeah, I, I don't exactly, know, I mean, and, and they get to push, you know, the term the opioid crisis. That's become the only acceptable way to talk about it within mainstream media. Like, well, well, hold on, stop and think about what that means. What, what, yeah, what are the details of said crisis? Exactly. Oh, we're not going to talk about that. No, no, we're gonna okay. We're gonna like talk about some vague amorphous. Oh, we're gonna provide support for services and this, you know, whatever. Oh, it's very sad. You know, disingenuous in the way that only America can be. I so I so there's a very so there's an interesting um, I'm pretty sure this is where it comes in uh, in the documentary about the Sex Pistols. There's actually a, a a clip of or an interview where Sid Vicious explains what um, heroin withdrawal was like for him and why he ended up relapsing during the America tour so fast was you know because it's really this uh, ultimately devastating thing to your to your body like you know if you're not prepared to do that and you're just kind of taken out of where you are then someone's like hey do you want some heroin like of course you're going to fucking take it at that point. So I wanted to bring that into it. It was my first time in America. Sid would sit next to me and we'd look out the window and we'd stare at that endless scenery and imagine John Wayne and the Indians. He wouldn't sleep, he wouldn't want to because it was so first time. He was just looking for a smack and being an idiot. What I'm got into his ego. It just got really depressing really quick. But the point is, Sid's my mate, and I don't want him to be a junkie. This is why we travelled on the bus. This is why Sid was to stick with me. And like the others just didn't understand. They thought, you know, you know, oh, you, you can handle it, man. But like, dope sickness isn't like that. It's not something that you can just blow away. It's the worst sickness you could ever imagine. He was far too young for that shit. And un-American for that shit. I can drink, and I can drink a druggie out of being a druggie. And I will do that for my friends every time, any time. You can't get comfortable when you sweat and you're boiling hot and you pour all the sweat and your nose dribbles and, and all of a sudden you get the cold and the sweat turns to fucking ice on you and you put a jumper on and then you're boiling hot again you take it off and you're like, you get cold again like you just can't win you lie down and that's not you sit up that's not fun. it drives you insane I despise Sid for it and I'll despise anyone for messing with it ever since it is the only drug that really cancels out all creativity. It is about self-pity. It is the lowest, the worst form of life. King heroin, James Brown. So it's, no, but like, you know, I mean, this is his own, you know, his own friends, his own bandmates yeah. that are kind of uh, blaming him for just kind of being weak. And he's explaining, I mean, in that interview, like, it's not that I was just weak. It's that, you know, this is something that decimates your body. And, you know, I mean, there's a reason that they bring people into like rehabs for that kind of, um, uh, you know, at the very least, they bring people into rehabs for that, for that kind of addiction, because 
it's like, you know, the, the physical toll of expecting someone to go on stage every night for like months on end while also being like, and you have to kick heroin. Like it's ridiculous, especially like a 20 year old that doesn't, or 19 or 20 year old, that doesn't have any necessarily, you know, like doesn't have any of the, the coping skills or the tools to even understand why they're kind of drawn into this in the first place. It's like, oh, well, maybe, you know, maybe a change of scenery will help, which is, I mean, to be fair, it's the most British thing to say ever. Like, you know, they'd have, uh, like, <laughs> oh, like, we'll go on holiday. Like, yeah. You know, like, British, well, British people would get like sick with, uh, you know, just debilitating like tuberculosis. They'd be like, a little bit of sea air would do you good. Right. <laughs> well, and, and it, it, they, in a very small segment of time, kind of bring up both of the allure and the, banal mediocrity of boredom that is tour too that is mm -hmm. it, and it's a weird uh, you know i i guess i had to tell the story i have to mention that like actually played two shows this last weekend one of which was with the documentary that i'm in about touring called why am i doing this and it's very surreal by the way to like play a set after a movie you're in kind of like you know kind of bizarre but like that's ex explained like uh you know in so many ways by so many different people of just how it's like a double-edged sword of like, you know, you love doing it and it's, you know, it's great when it happens, but there's so much time that, you know, people think it's like, yeah, man, Grand Funk Railroad, we're coming to your town. We're going to party you down, smoke you out, shag a few groupies. Cool. It's like, it's not like that at all, man. You're like, just, you see a lot of gas stations and you see a lot of like fields and things along those lines. And then like for about, you know, half hour to 40 minutes, you know, maybe more, if you're a bigger band, you get to be alive. And you get to yeah. do something amazing. So take that times like being a kid and you're in a foreign country. And also, let's not put too fine a point on it here. Malcolm McLaren booked him in places he knew they would be hated in the Deep South. Specifically, specifically did that to provoke a reaction because he was interested in the spectacle. He was interested in the results, not the safety of the band. And that's again, when I, when I mentioned the P.T. Barnum thing like way early on, that's what I'm talking about. It was all just dollars, dollars and cents for that guy. And to be put in that kind of situation where you have like your this exciting, discomforting adventure, but also with these long periods of boredom. Well, guess what? If you have a predilection towards certain substances that make some of that stuff easy, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, I mean, but also on top of that, it's just kind of bringing them to another country and expecting that going cold turkey on that substance yeah. Oh, yeah, that'll like, help. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> so, you know, on, on top of on top of the whole thing about, you know, I mean, touring obviously is boring, and they're sitting on a on a bus because they they feel like maybe a bus will stop him from for whatever reason will stop him from his um, addiction. So, on top of all of that, like, they're making him go cold turkey during this uh, during this trip, which is something that you know is ridiculously hard, even if you're in a fucking hospital. Yeah, it's, it's cruel alone, when you, know, you have a attendant care. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's kind of like a it's it's the most ridiculous. Um, yeah, no, it's the most ridiculous way to to treat uh, that 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 addiction. But but then at the same time, you know, it's at that point where they're thinking, oh, this is a weakness on his part. Like the reason that he's in the situation is because he's weak. Like if we just bring him out of a situation where he's weak, or if we bring him out of this relationship that's you know dragging him down a bad path. Um, things will be different, and that's it, it's just a nonsensical way to treat that. I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've talked plenty, and I'm, I don't want to dominate things, but my mom, who passed away recently, uh, was an addict. And of course, when you are an addict, you continue to be an addict, even if you're not using. And to her credit, she uh, was clean for a, a great many years. But I basically got to see every kind of drug done in front of me, other than heroin by the time I was about 13 years old. And I have a different view on drugs because of that. It isn't like fun time escape party times for me. It's sort of like, no, I got to see the real cost of like what that looks like when you get that stupid and get that dependent upon certain substance to be able to do certain things. So I have an outsized experience with that. But yeah. most people don't. And what most people, what people most know from drugs, I love Bill Hicks, but the whole like, hey, if you don't, you know, and it, again, the whole thing was, I'm going to do it. Nancy Reagan, though, Nancy Reagan's like say no to drugs thing. And Bill Hicks bit about that. You know, if you really want, you know, people say no to drugs, throw your entire record collection away. I absolutely hate, 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 hate the idea that the drugs make the creativity because it is a lie. The drugs do yeah. not make the creativity. The drugs potentially help the person. 
deal with whatever is in their life. But the creativity does not come from the drugs. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's also the same thing with, you know, in the 1940s and 50s, when they have no idea kind of what these drugs can really do. They have every single star that they're kind of bringing around on tour. They give them an upper in the morning and a downer at night. <laughs> and so many, yeah. No, so, so many, uh, you know, really, really famous stars that are like American icons ended up ODing throughout, you know, from the 1940s, really to the 19, I mean, well, really till now, but like, especially in that time period, because they were giving them some kind of amphetamine uh, in the morning, they perform, and then they gave them some kind of barbiturate at night. And they were mixing that with drinking because they didn't know that, you know, you can't mix barbiturates and drinking. And people like would die in the tub and they'd be like, oh, why did this person die? It's because your manager, whoever it is, would hand you those substances. And, you know, that was considered like, hey, like we need to wake you up at this time. We need to make you go to sleep at this time. We're kind of managing your life on drugs to the point where, you know, you'd be partying at two in the morning or something, take your barbiturate, drink alcohol. And then, you know, how many how many celebrities do we know that had uh, not we know, but like how many celebrities have been kind of American icons? that have died in these weird circumstances because of a barbiturate overdose, which is something that doesn't happen anymore necessarily, but like, you know, so many of them that happened to, and that was kind of a precursor to heroin. Um, but like one prescribed, I mean, not, you know, heroin still existed, but like a precursor to heroin in the sense of, uh, you know, like a lot of like celebrities were dying in mass because of that. Well, I mean, it's, I, I, uh, the drug part of, of, of working class culture in the United States is, is something that is both vilified and romanticized in equal portions in our culture in ways that for similar reasons to, to Conan, I detest, I have people who, um, you know, in my, in my immediate family, in my life, there's, there's at least three people who are already dead from, from, from ODs and, um, I've had brothers and I won't, you know, I won't name names, but I have brothers who've been in and out of rehab. So like, I know it. And and it is a weird, it's a phenomenon that is kind of classed. Um, and I do think that's actually part of the Sid Vicious story. Um, and, and. Uh, at a time you know, earlier, I think at a time earlier than in the U.S. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, one thing that we have to remember, like when we call neoliberalism Thatcherism, it's Thatcherism because Thatcher like put it on steroids. But the the uh, the Labor Party began that in like 1974, um, and and so like it was already kind of bad, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, and I, I also and you think that, you have that here exactly the same with. Uh... Carter and then raping yeah. like same yeah. time period yeah and no um, future man no future <laughs> right and and I think you know and I don't think a lot of people actually understood what was going on even in the UK at the time during that part of the labor administration they were blaming labor like labor socialist policies when actually they were liberalizing um uh during the 70s anyway um so it's plus I mean, in the British case in specific, you have the malaise of a decline of empire and all the loss of resources that that really entails. Yeah, um, 100%. So, you know, we, we might be going through something ourselves like that maybe very soon. Um, so, you know, I think I think a lot of British 70s movies are going to feel pretty relevant again. Um, but uh, it's, it. I think that's, that's interesting. It, it, maybe to tie it back... To, which I is mean, also wait, which is also a reason that I think Alex Cox, as a director, understood um, this this concept a lot. Like like before, I mean, you have you have directors like Alex Cox and like Verhoeven that are understanding mm -hmm. this phenomenon going on in Europe um, far before uh, you know anybody like U.S. directors or Hollywood directors are understanding it. You have you know where, where it's happening at a slightly earlier time, maybe than than neoliberalism starts to come to the U.S. Um, I think we, I also am very fascinated with this, with, you know, we were talking about the color theory, but, um, this, uh, I, I, I've watched now four Cox movies with, uh, for your show, um, Forrest and a lot of I, I do, one, yeah, two, three, Cox. four, that's a lot and of Cox. Actually, <laughs> and actually on the Cox, um, the one thing I will say is um, if I have any criticism at, of him as a director in these early movies, and I know this actually changes later on, um, 
women are not really characters in his movies. Um, yep. <laughs> um, as apparently, as apparently, they're not in the show. Not for any fault of our own. Yeah, where's Jamie? <laughs> Because uh, we only know the one, apparently. But yeah, okay. <laughs> we we had, I mean, you know, we've I've, we've been trying to be a lot more inclusive. Yeah, Last yeah, week we had uh we had the girls from these are bad movies, like you know. So we've been trying to pick that up. It was a criticism that I think is well warranted. It was a criticism on uh, GTA for a little bit that I thought was well warranted, which made me kind of sensitive to this, not on purpose or anything, but like you know, the idea that like women needed to be more represented in podcasting in general but you know it, it's easy to just bro out on movies yeah i think you booked something today that kind of uh should be pretty rad yeah i i don't want to i don't want to jinx that no, no, no. i'm not i'm not spoiling anything stay tuned incredible um but yeah no that that's going to be probably the most incredible moment we have on this you know this entire show ever but um but, well until um, alex cox come on Right. Yeah. <laughs> After we're down to his really terrible later movies, apparently. I want to set things straight. Let me on your fucking podcast. Yeah. You guys mm. keep this down to 20 minutes, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can give some <laughs> lessons. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I the last the last I guess clip I wanna play. Um, is oh, the, real quick, can I just mention yeah. that, like, we, we I, I like indirectly addressed it, but I feel like we should directly address that. Hey, y'all, Sid Vicious was wearing a swastika t shirt, right? Yeah. Like, again, when I talk about it being provocateur and like anything that pissed off the Tories, like, it's very fraught, obviously, now for that, for that sort of symbolism. And if you'll notice within Sid and Nancy, like that shirt didn't make an appearance. I think it had like a hammer and sickle or something along those oh, lines. Oh yeah, right no, there. his shirt had a hammer and sickle instead of yeah. A there. But yeah. the idea is like you know without when you, and when you talk about taking things from their time and contextualizing it to modern times and modern values, clearly nobody would do that now. And if you know, was does that mean Sid Vicious was anti-Semitic? No, he's just a fucking dumbass kid. And he's wearing a shirt to piss people off. Is what he was doing. And he was doing that on a grander scale. So henceforth, why I also like the fact that that earlier clip was talking about like, you know, hey, you know, is there anything, you know, political? Oh, well, we're not fascist, you know, blah, 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 this and that. Because 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 of those just provocateur emotions, people then, not now, where you like, if you say or do anything, then you embody the entire ethos of the thing because people don't understand allegory or nuance anymore that like. I like that that was directly addressed, even though it was on some shitty Colin show with like feedback going over the <laughs> over the phones and like some guy with a heroic mustache. I might Conan, add. Conan neutron versus cancel culture. Well, Rain yeah, I mean, I guess that's what I'm driving up to, right? But it, but it's it's, I mean, let's be real. Like, I it uh, clearly I know why he didn't include it in the movie because it's like all oh, anyone would talk about. It. Like, okay, so so let's put it this way: in the in the original King Kong. Believe me, this is going to go somewhere. In the original King Kong, there's this scene where they are going over this bridge to get over to like a thing like King Kong's lair or something. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. But like some people fall off and then like these gigantic insects come in and just devour them and rip them apart. And this is the 1930s, right? And so they they played it for test audiences. All people want we're talking about afterwards is, man, those giant insects, though. Jesus. And they were like, hey, how about the fucking gigantic ape that we like base this entire goddamn film after? And nobody like it just it stole the show. So in that That's same way, the giant insects, bugs. the only good bug is a dead bug. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's how we got Starship Troopers, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, no, but like some things are so full stop that, yeah. that it you would ignore the rest of the story of like, no, these are doom junkies, kind of like Romeo and Juliet, also a cautionary tale about heroin, tangentially related to music, blah, blah, blah. Like, that bro wearing, got a swastika on. He wears that swastika shirt his entire time in the U.S. If you watch any interview of him nodding out in the U.S., he's literally yeah, he wearing does. that same swastika shirt. Yep. Um, you know, he's like and he's doing it to pick, get a rise out of people. That's why he's yeah. doing it. He's not doing it because he's a Nazi. But... The only person that we let do that now is a friend of show, Zizak. We let him kind of do, do provocative things. <laughs> but, but anyway, no, thank you for letting me tell the King Kong story because I think that's a that's a fantastic early film tale, which is relevant to the movie, uh, and also a good example of how uh, certain motions of spectacle can overwhelm overall messaging and storytelling. 
Well, it's like it's like the WWE, right? Or like anything like that. Like it's kind of creating these characters, some of which are heels, some of which are kind of just kids railing against the system that's uh, currently going on. And, uh, you know, it's creating these kind of characters that don't, aren't necessarily great at what they do. Like nobody in the WWE is a good fucking actor necessarily. You know what I mean? Like in the same way that, well, I mean, in the same way that like nobody in, they're allowed to be, you're allowed to be kind of corny and you're allowed to be a little bit more, um, you know, like, like showy than you would in other situations. And I think it's the same with the punk movement. Cause I watch anything with the edge in it. <laughs> But so I think it's kind of creating like these wrestling characters almost that you know are allowed to get away with things because you know that those people are either uh, thrashing at the wall or being a heel or like any number of things really and you love them for it you yell things at them you know you really you you throw people to their music. I mean, I love David Bowie. David Bowie is one of my favorite artists. I admire uh, many things about David Bowie, not just the music, but how he constantly reinvented himself over his career. But he had severe fascistic imagery, and it wasn't because he was a fascist. Oh no, you can you can keep going. I'm. I was just you know. Oh, I was gonna say it wasn't because he was a fascist. He was just like, oh, this will provoke people. This will make people well, think yeah. about. I mean, at the it, time know? though, right. he was a little he was a little fashy uh, for for like a brief moment in the seventies. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that was that was the cocaine speaking. Yeah, as I was going <laughs> to... Well, I believe his diet is, was... I'm not going to speak for David Bowie, but yeah, I, don't, I think it's fair to say he was no Nazi. The, the fat, this like the fast drug, you know what I mean? Like, people yeah. people that, are, that aren't aren't expanding their creativity through it, they're like, we should do this right now. Get it, it's like a new order. It. Look, let's do it. I was about to say, yeah, if, if you... Uh, Another music movie that has cocaine and vague fascism would be uh, um, anything involving Sid Barrett. Um, but uh, it, yeah, the provoking the provoking thing. I think it, it is interesting um, how it works because you would think maybe like flying flying a swastika in the UK would be like flying the Confederate flag now, but it's not. It's both less political and worse um so i i really don't know of an equivalent to what you could have done um as a shock factor in the united states now call someone a cunt yeah uh, <laughs> yeah fair. in the uk no one cares yeah exactly <laughs> all right so this is this is the last uh clip i have and it's uh it's from the it's from a documentary called uh Sid by those who knew him and it's kind of his friends speculating on what happened um around his death which isn't necessarily obviously the most important um you know thing of this conversation but I thought it was interesting to bring in for the last the last clip Sponge and have been stabbed to death. Room was uh, very bloody. There was blood on the sheets and blood on the mattress. There was tracks of blood leading into the bathroom where the body of the female was found lying under the sink. And she was stabbed in the stomach. I wish that I could have gone there and given him some sort of support. It was just such a sad situation. Uh, I always knew he never murdered. Uh, Nancy, I just knew it. I mean, there was just no way he would. Um, so it had to be a terrible accident. I feel vindicated by that. But of course, the tabloid press just went for him in a big way because he was selling newspapers. It was meant to happen. Nancy always said she'd die before she was 21. <coughs> The victim, Nancy Spungen of Philadelphia, was found in the singer's suite at the Chelsea Hotel. He's been charged with second-degree murders. To watch Sid Vicious, this hopeful, exuberant, enthusiastic teenager, become such a fulcrum of hatred and condemnation, and then ultimately destroying himself and other people, and becoming um, this murderer, it's a tragedy, and personally, what, you know, one just feels um, very great sadness. What would you like to happen now over the next, say, year or two? <coughs> I'd like to have fun. What sort of fun? 
any kind of fun, just fun. That's my object in life. Are you having fun at the moment? Are you kidding? I'm not having fun at all. Where would you like to be? Under the ground. I didn't think Sid had done it. You know, I knew him really well. Uh, I, I knew he could be out of it, and I knew she was someone who could push you to the limits. You know, she utterly goaded and pushed people to their limits anyway, drove you to distraction, actually, with her whining and moaning. But, um, and, you know, if it, if it had been him, then it, then it would have been done in such a sort of understandable way that it wasn't like a murder, if you know what I mean. So there, there was no way I thought, oh, Sid, how could you have done that? I knew it would either been such an extreme, druggy, insane situation or that some, someone else, they'd got caught up in some deal and someone else had done it. But I, I didn't, you know, I, I totally... I'm with Sid as a good person, really. Sid Vicious will not have to stand trial for the murder of a girlfriend at the Chelsea Hotel. Sid is no longer vicious, he's dead. His nude body found in a Greenwich Village apartment, spoon and syringe nearby. The heroin overdose may have been accidental. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. A friend had gone. You know, somebody I knew had died, you know, it's... And way too young. Police say they were told by the victim's girlfriend that his last hours were spent looking toward the future. He was speaking about his future. The conversation with his girlfriend was about his future. And it appears from the conversation he didn't want to uh, do away with himself. What sort of future was he contemplating? I have no idea. It was an accident. He had no intention of doing himself in. And if... Um, I'm to believe anything that he said to me that particular evening. Um, he, uh, he was more concerned with clearing his name. He was not in a suicidal mood or, you know, I'm going to kill myself, I'm fed up with everything, or some stupid suicide pact with Nancy. No, no. <laughs> wow. Imagine any other context, though, where like a news reporter could be like, Sid is no longer vicious. He's dead. I was going to say, like, even in like a news report of his death, there has to be like such deep contempt and goofing on the man. Like, wow, fuck you, dude. Seriously. And like Nancy doesn't even get named after a girlfriend. You know, piece of yeah. shit. No wonder they're all fucking oh, nihilist. Other, about him. He was with his. So he had another girlfriend after uh, Nancy. And so she was the one that found him. So I think yeah. that's what they were referencing in that. But still, you know, it is such contempt. It's like well, it was obviously know. Courtney Love. <laughs> <laughs> Courtney Love killed uh, um, Nancy Spungen, so so they could end the movie. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, I kind of hate the the fact were, that were they like, mermaids uh, too? Is that what, what happened yes, afterwards? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Courtney, no, no, Love I, I, and, I, Courtney Love and a mermaid in the end. No, I, I mean, I was just going to say, I really hate the fact that people really do uh, just just come down on Courtney Love the way that they do. Like, um, you know, she's she's an addict. I'm, you know, that that you know, she also has uh, uh, one of those personalities that that you know drive people away from her. Uh, I've spoken to people who actually knew her from uh, you know yeah, back too. in the days in Seattle, <laughs> and, and so like you know, and and Nancy Sponge has kind of become like. A, you know, was a Courtney Love of a generation. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm you know, saying. You could so say, when and, you say and, when you say is somebody that uh, people really were driven away by her personality, like just like Nancy Spungen. Um, You know, she's kind yeah. of been. I mean, uh, they, they hated her back in England. It's. It, I mean, so it's hard to it's hard to watch. Um, maybe an interpretation, at least after because I watched several documentaries on like uh, the Sex Pistols and like just to get clips for this uh, thing, and it's hard it's hard to really watch all of those and see like literally just like a 20 year old, 19 year old girl who's thrown into the position where she needs to manage kind of one of the biggest stars, like with a heroin addiction needs to manage one of the biggest stars uh, that existed at that time. And everyone's like, yeah, it's her fault. Like, yeah, obviously she's not going to fucking do a great job of it. She, num number one, she's a drug addict. Someone should be looking after her and she's fucking 20. <laughs> She, sh he shouldn't yeah. be managed by a twenty-year-old. Like that's not a failure on her part. That's a failure on everybody around. Suspicious. <laughs> well, the, all the all the negative 
aspects of her have been told ad nauseum and amplified a hundred thousand fold. Whereas few people ever think at it from that very humanistic standpoint of just what must that be like? Maybe she might want to find an escape of some kind, you know, I mean, I'm, 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 I mean, I'm pretty close to, you know, I mean, like my age is closer to, uh, their age than it is i think to some of the people that are telling like the stories of what happened in retrospect you know what i mean yeah so like thinking back to what i was like at 19 or 20 and whether i would have like if someone had just been like hey like do you want to manage one of the biggest uh like because i was deep into like a phase of you know party i mean not that kind of partying but like you know like going out to parties like not really giving a fuck like getting myself into dumb conversations getting myself into dumb moments like and so i look onto that and i say like yo imagine if like all of a sudden someone's like yo all right just 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 manage one of the biggest stars that exists right now like yeah. that would be a train wreck that would be an absolute train wreck <laughs> yeah and it's a story that's been told again and again um you know i'm not going to speak too much about courtney love i'll just say that i you know i, I don't i can't say if we're friends but i'm friendly with patty Schemmel, who played in her with hole so i could there's a whole bunch that maybe i could say but i ain't gonna uh, I will say that I think she's similarly misunderstood, though. Like, and and not like to be let off the hook in certain ways, yeah. but like <laughs> she's a villain to people. And like, whether that's true or not doesn't matter because they need her to be the villain. They need someone to be the bad guy. And I think Nancy kind of got. And I mean, got... I, I, mean the the, the... Yeah. I was just gonna say, there's like documentaries about uh, Courtney Love about how she murdered Kurt and yeah. had like these people help her and. Drag exactly. the body. Yeah, it's it's your fictions it's, in the same way that the end of this movie is, you know, where, where it's just like, yeah, that yeah. didn't actually happen though. Like, cool story, bro, but that didn't actually happen. You have no way of, you know, that that's even based in reality. It just made for a better film. Yeah. Yeah. I mean and, and, and I just hate go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I mean it's the, the suicide pack thing bugs me for a lot of reasons, one of which is while the evidence is pretty damning for Sid Vicious. Um, it's not absolute. It really isn't. And there have been other people who have claimed to done, uh, who have claimed in drunken fervors to have done the the murder. Um, El Duce <laughs> was constantly uh, drunken. We just might add. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, and and there was a lot more traffic apparently through that hotel room that day too. Uh. Um, because there was heroin going in and out of it, so there were, there was at least two different drug dealers there. So all signs of stuff well, could have happened. Actually, this is this is something that I wanted to bring up for the end of this movie, and um, mm -hmm. that's the grassy being, knoll of our generation, by the way. Is is the Lee Harvey Oswald killed. Killed, killed both <laughs> yeah. Nancy and Sid Vicious. Um, which, by the way, I have to announce something at the end of this that is coming up soon. That's going to be fucking amazing. But um, uh, involving Lee Harvey Oswald, he's a guest on this podcast. No. <laughs> well, he was a communist. Um <laughs> I'm friends so, with the band right. Steve Harvey Oswald who are great. I'm I'm ready I'm ready to announce this after taking it out last week at uh I'm going to be doing I'm going to be hosting um This is Revolution on September 1st and we're going to be doing JFK. Oliver Stone's JFK as our uh as our as our movie. So th it's gonna, that's going to be fucking amazing. But cuz we have uh we have we have Cuba coming on as like a former member of the DC. That's exciting. To we have so he's gonna analyze like you know anyway um no so so I want to bring can, can I announce story. that I'm that I'm guest hosting next week or does that take away from your announcement oh man <laughs> <laughs> I don't got lined up like that though you're good man <laughs> um, I just forgot until you said that I was like oh yeah, yeah I'm doing that no, next week. that's gonna be yeah. that's gonna be exciting and then we have our big thing that I'm not ready to announce yet because I, I I need that to you know happen before we announce it but um. <laughs> Stay tuned, folks. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to bring up uh, good friends, um, frequent tweet collaborator Xander Berkeley, um, in in those last uh, in those last scenes as kind of the drug dealer that you know comes in and uh, and finds Nancy dead. Um, really, just you know, I I got the feeling, and I think that it's well founded that uh, you know he's kind of the devil, like he's kind of the interpret because you know he comes in the first time and there's flames engulfing everything um mm -hmm. at, at that point and you know he's kind of he's the one that kind of plants the idea in the movie and says head that possibly he needs to uh kill nancy he's like you know what i would have done if she was disrespectful like that to me 
So it seems like maybe, you know, Xander Berkeley is a, is a representation of heroin or as, you know, as kind of the devil um, in this sense, which, uh, you know, I, I wanted to get everyone's take on that as like, you know, one of the final. Yeah, he's like a stand in for that, you know, Luciferian character, like the, the dark temptation and whatnot. And is he a pastiche of actual real people? doesn't matter it's there to serve the story and to kind of like give you that sort of Chekhov's gun foreshadowing well, I mean, you know he is a, a pastiche of real people because yeah. you know i mean there were drug dealers coming into that out of their apartment this is just kind oh, of yeah. the most satanic representation of a drug dealer that you can possibly come up with which also i feel really bad for xander berkeley because we i keep tweeting at him every time i'm like oh xander berkeley and i put his at name in there and uh so i He's like this so motherfucker I, <laughs> so, so, so gabriel who's um you know one of one of uh, andy's good friends that has like actually made like you know documentaries and stuff and included xander berkeley because like he knows him um he, he he tagged Xander Berkeley in my like oh we're gonna do Sid and Nancy and was like oh are you guys just going through all of Xander Berkeley's films and like brought Xander Berkeley into the <laughs> the conversation <laughs> which <laughs> I mean what does that guy's day look like he's probably like oh that's cool like he called me on, he called me you know? movie night extravaganza guy yeah and, and exactly because I because I said I said he's an amazing actor in one tweet like a while ago and he said thank you for a movie night extravaganza guy and I was like. Sander knows. Sander knows my my quick bio. <laughs> I mean, I if we learned anything so, from Malcolm know? McLaren, as long as people are talking, it's a good thing, right? So, yeah. But I, I just I, Oh, okay. I, I did get uh, to introduce one of his short films uh, when he couldn't make it for for an event. Um, uh, which uh, was, a, was a fun little movie. It was a uh, uh, actually Conan would appreciate. It. It's about a rock star with a uh, uh, writer's block, and then he writes a really. <laughs> that sad was a documentary for me last March, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, but, but yeah, no. Someone made a short film about Conan. <laughs> yeah, no, and Xander Berkeley played him. <laughs> but yeah, no, no, it's, it's, good, uh, yeah, it was it was a fantastic little film. Um, the best thing is the fact that that they had this uh, child actress who was just phenomenal, Xander. Like like, they 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 worked together somehow, and like, the, the whole thing was like this child pulling Xander Berkeley out of like. This it sounds familiar. Was what in. was this called? This sounds familiar. What was uh, this Goldfish? I think it's called. Okay, yeah, this, yeah, I think I remember hearing about this. It, it's, I think it's I had the awesome. exact same reaction where I was like, I don't want to watch that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Now I can't. No, Last year, not so much. Not deep in the cold. Yeah, but but uh, he was actually in Massachusetts uh, filming a film at the time and was uh, considering coming by this event where, where uh, uh, I arranged to get his uh, short film in there uh, through through my, uh, you know my fr uh, our mutual friend and uh, uh, the the person hosting it last minute goes here introduce the film and I'm like I've not seen this film I don't know what I'm talking about oh man. <laughs> so, by the way, you one, know, more, like, one more, one uh, more. There's like 50 people, and like right in front of me is uh, uh, Joan, uh, oh, what's her name? Jane, uh, it's a famous writer. Uh, Yo, Yo, oh, I'll have to Jane Eyre? No, no, it starts with a Y, her last name. Yo, she's like a I fantasy am. writer. <laughs> she's like, she's like sitting right in front of me, too. Like, uh -huh. like, I could, I was actually sitting next to her, but like, I, you know, I could like reach out and touch her. And, and here Joan, I am, just like, Joan, I have to Joan speak, and I have no clue what I said. <laughs> Um, one more, one more connection to the Xander Berkeley thing. Obviously, the grandpa in this movie is played by the guy from Tapeheads, uh, that played like oh, right, the, yeah. the Melvin, the Melvin character or whatever that they have um, recite the will. So our first, our first Xander Berkeley foray that we really uh, got really hyped about was Tapeheads, and we did it on uh, on on Andy's podcast, uh, yeah, on on his birthday, and that was that was fun. But it was funny seeing it, like because I saw the grandpa and I was like. Where the fuck have I seen this actor before? And I looked it up and I was like, oh, yeah, that's that scene where they have him read the will and he dies in the middle of it. Um, Tapehead's also was, great for the Joe Biafra appearance as the uh, agent, with, considering what was going on in Joe Biafra's life around that time, too. It was doubly hilarious. Yeah, Jane Yolen is the, uh, the author's you. name. You know, Jane Yolen, got it. Very famous author. And I'm sitting here like I don't know what I'm doing. Was she, was yeah. she like watching you? Like uh, let's watch this motherfucker choke or what? Like, what was what was, the, <laughs> what was the scene, man? 
I, you know what, like, like I, I just completely went blank and just went with the moment and said some stuff about the film and Sandra Berkeley and how I arranged everything and and it's like the show I, then. Okay, I said yeah, no, it, <laughs> it, it was. <laughs> <your range>. no. <laughs> but but like doing it live in front of like a hundred people. Oh, so That's it's not like the show. That's way bigger. Yeah. <laughs> All right, fuck you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> what did you want to actually talk about for us? You played that clip not to hear about that story. What, what was it you want? You wanted no, to? No, I just uh, I, don't, I just thought it was interesting to hear you know people that actually knew him, knew him and yeah. you know no to humanize him because I think that this movie does the opposite. This movie uh, doesn't humanize him, and and I think that the reason is pretty clearly that um, Alex Cox is making a political point rather than mm -hmm. a, a humanistic point, which I, I think is understandable but you know you really watch those clips and you watch um the interview clips where they're talking and you really realize how young they were and and thrown into the situation and it's like you know alex cox is clearly making the point that like oh they betrayed the movement they betrayed their ideals but it's like they're also like 20 and it's fine to make a movie um making the case that they betrayed their ideals it's fine to make a movie making the case that the punk movement betrayed its ideals but you know you're also including like these 20 year olds that don't necessarily have any real connection to the punk movement um, in the sense of like, you know, I mean, before, cause you know, watching all these documentaries, like he's just kind of running around being a hooligan and then they, and then he's brought in because his friends are in the sex pistols. Like, Hey, do you want to be the bassist yeah. uh, later on? So it's not like he's kind of the first person that is brought into this role. And it's not like he's uh, someone that necessarily has ideals in that sense. I think it's similar in the, and I'm, I'm really going to, I'm sorry. I want to, I want, I'm going to let everyone else speak eventually, uh, but the uh, it, it, there's some parallels I think uh, allegory wise with uh, that I thought was well done with the NWA movie in mm -hmm. in the same way and the fact that like it's like yeah there's some like really jacked up stuff that NWA was was, was rapping about but like they were kids yeah from Compton <laughs> like what did you expect and i thought that that i actually liked that movie i thought that movie was good i didn't think it was like you know hey masterwork whatever but i thought it was a good movie also i yeah, no, skipped just I liked, like him i liked that movie um, i liked it yeah. i thought it was good thank god we're talking about it after the both the black guests left right but you know okay <laughs> uh, but i think there's a parallel to that right as as far as being like oh no you have to answer for a movement and like a musical genre and like a political ethos and this and that that's like which, by They're the way, NWA, their case, I mean, NWA, like, I guess, uh, like the Sex Pistols, kind of, was the most tame version of that genre. Was it was a, a group of people that didn't necessarily have a, an organic connection to that genre. You know what I mean? Like, sure, they were living in, in Compton at the time, but it, it's not like they were really, like, like I mean, Easy e I guess, but, like, it's not really like they were... Yeah, Easy e definitely lived the life. No, I mean, let's be, let's be real. But, but Maybe no, not but, Dr. Dre, but... <laughs> but, like, no, but, I mean, at least, yeah, like, because it's a big, you know, it's a big group. It's not necessarily, like, all of them have this organic connection to the to what they're pushing. And a lot of the time, I mean, Easy e didn't, never really wrote his own songs. It was kind of Ice Cube writing a lot of Easy es lyrics, who... Ice Cube was not necessarily someone who had... I mean, they're living in this, they're living in that condition, just as, you know... The Sex Pistols are living in the condition of a working class, um, like 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 a working class declining imperial state. Like so, they're obviously living it from that sense. But it's it's not maybe like you know gangster rap after uh, N.W.A. becomes um, a lot more vicious in a way that I think most of them aren't really ready for, or most of them aren't represent representing. Well, um, I think the edges have been rounded off by time, but I mean, fuck the police is was pretty edgy, dude. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying their music wasn't edgy. I'm, I mean, and still uh, continues to be like, but, but, but no, I, I know I'm, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying in the sense of like, you know, um, once again, almost like these kind of wrestling characters in some ways, like yeah. they aren't, you know, you're put on stage, uh, like the music blows up. You're kind of just kids. You're, you're kids living in this environment for sure. Your kids living in an environment that's kind of um, in the state of decline. Your kids that are living within this maybe political and and you know uh, what like like that reality. But you're not necessarily um, uh, you know you're not necessarily involved in things in a way that so, like suddenly you're involved in this musical scene and they're kind of creating these characters for you to play because of who you are, because of what you look like, because of where you're from that aren't necessarily reflective of you know who you are at, at the core. 
um, that you either, think, either like have to, uh, you know, either live up to or completely rebel against and or both. Yeah. And then the one I, I think one notable difference is that, like, you know, I'm not going to speak to that dude's credit that managed NWA, but they didn't have a Malcolm McLaren type trying to basically vampire through everything like this. Like yes, this they did. Thing. The point of that movie not, is that they did. Well, the guy, was, not, the guy was dividing them and was only really interested in Easy E as a character because he was the most easy to manipulate. He, he was interested in the divide and conquer aspect of it, which is the same. But I, I think there were certain ways that uh, I think NWA, just by nature of when they when they came up, had a even though they were kids, had a greater awareness of certain things that allowed that guy to not be the Malcolm McLaren of yeah. you know the rap nineties. And, and also, I mean, I don't think that guy was considered, like their guy. That guy was never considered their friend. Like, no, no, exactly. Well, Malcolm McLaren presented yeah. as their friend, right? He presented yeah. as like, "Hey, I'm your friend." We're gonna do this cool thing, and I'm gonna help you do like even more. And yeah, like so, so the thought, of, I think, I think that you're right in the sense of there's kind of an outsider status that that guy had, where where he's not necessarily like presenting as like Steve Buscemi. That's like, how do you do, fellow kids? Like, if somebody <laughs> like, oh, this, is, this is this is a this is a record label executive. He might. Be I heard you like the hippity hop. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> but, but literally, like, this might be a record label executive, but he's kind of on our side. Whatever. Like. As opposed to like, oh, this is our buddy that we've done a bunch of drugs and drank with. There's no way that that guy could be fucking us over. So I 100 percent agree that there's more suspicion on that guy than there would be, I think, on uh, on Malcolm McLaren because Malcolm McLaren is just kind of like, hey, buddies, let's party on this boat, and they're like, uh, like sounds <laughs> good. And and I think that Alex Cox does a good job of showing that. Um, I think it's a little too subtle for my taste because I don't think it was subtle. Um, but I do think McLaren's a vicious character. If I haven't made it clear, like as much as I bang, uh, you know, banged hard on Hans Zimmer that for the Dune episode, like Malcolm McLaren's a shitty person, like a terrible person that should be remembered in his, as in uh, his place in history as such. And like that's yeah. almost objectively so. It's sort of like, yeah, maybe had a few redeeming aspects, but you are basically an actual villain, like a, 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 um, you know, Machiavellian, which is completely overused, like musical, not even musically inclined guy that just was a shameless profiteer that liked manipulating yeah. people because he was good at it and he wanted to advance the pieces on the chessboard. And he was making 100% of the money. I mean, you know, in some yeah, sense, like he was giving them no residuals, which is crazy that you don't know that there are residuals you can get because it, it, it's clear that they realize after the fact, oh, hey, we're not getting any of the money from this. This must be a normal thing. And it's like, at this point, I can't see that anyone would realize that it, you know what I mean? Like, cause you're right about that. Like the NWA movie, at least like they're showing like, Oh, like maybe, no, maybe they're not ready to read a contract. Right. In the way that somebody might be even today, but like, it's not like they're like, Oh, you can't get any residuals from this. There's no money to be made. This guy was literally saying, Oh, like, don't worry about it. Like, we're just going to party. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to spend this money. And no one questions like where does that money come from? Is that our money? It's just like this guy's our pal. Like, don't worry, he'll he'll, he'll take care of it. So that part of it, I think you're absolutely right. Um, well, and I, I think they're very similar. They're they're, they're similar stories uh, in a lot of ways, and you know they aren't the same story. But it, it's worth noting that like when people think of it as like, oh, this is this far off fairy tale, not that far off. You know, like things change and, and, and like there's more easy access to information into history now and things along those lines. But these people still exist. The stuff still happens. I know people that have had, been on the receiving end of it. You know what I mean? Like it, it's 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 still it all still happens. And people anytime there's going to be a buck to be made, someone will exploit to make that buck. It's hard not to believe you're 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 not the, the one doing that in that uh in that jacket. <laughs> hey everybody <laughs> come see the greatest show on earth yeah exactly all right so i'm gonna give everybody a chance to uh give their final thoughts give them twice as much because i've been dominating this whole back half my bad guys i'm i'm uh i'm gonna i'm gonna uh give everyone a chance to do their thoughts starting with andy and then obviously i'm gonna let conan plug his uh his album and everyone else plug whatever uh they want to plug but um, you know, the whole point of Cole coming on was that he was going to plug his album and then he's not, you know, they, they... well, it's okay. I did the cover, so I'm still going to plug the album. Okay. 
<laughs> yeah, I was gonna say maybe he's watching the movie right now and he's gonna come back with like a devastating final report. I have yeah, no. <laughs> I, I I'd love to hear what his thoughts on it because I, I do know he had a, a bit major heroin problem for a while. So so like you know, but I, I don't I know if he actually him, wants. To. I sent him a, a free link to the movie on Saturday, and said, <laughs> "Hey, if you want to come on, here's a link to the movie. You don't have to pay for it. You can get it on Daily Motion." And he was like, "Awesome!" And then didn't watch it. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, anyways, my final thoughts. Um, I I always feel like I should watch this movie more, but it's such like like the decline at the end is such a hard watch because it's it is a lot more gruesome than say the Mayans uh depiction of heroin. Um like like this one showed the bodily fluids all over everybody, and the Mayans just talked about it. Uh so so you know it's like show versus tell kind kind of thing. Um and I'm only thinking of that because that's the most recent thing I, I saw. Um, uh, I mean, it's also it's also interesting that you know, if anything, the bodily fluids aspect of punk got worse over time. Like, look at like Gigi Allen. Like, you know, what I mean, like that's probably the most uh, insane, <laughs> insidious version of that style of showmanship. Um, so it's interesting that that's included and in, like it's treated as something that you know you're looking at the decline, you're looking at the heroin addiction, and it's like this is one reason not to get involved in, 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 you know, in drugs in this way. But then also like the punk movement continued on with like how many, like how many blo like bodily fluids can you put on somebody <laughs> for a long time after this? Pretty much too, only too ended with AIDS. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say too bad Gigi Allen's music is garbage, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, the other thing too, is like, uh, I, I feel like the movie kind of skipped the, the uh, fact that, that, um, uh, punk was fueled by uh, amphetamines, you know, in the uh, uh, before heroin and around That's the time. Nancy... That's my as <laughs> someone with ADHD fueled by amphetamines. And, and uh, around the time Nancy Spongeon actually arrived, and that's why they have the story about her in this uh, the guitar case full of heroin, um, because it was like the you know, uh, and, and I don't know, maybe it was somebody from uh, the Heartbreakers uh, that, that you know that that brought it. whatever. It doesn't really matter. Uh, you know who did because it's it's about that time heroin came in and that's when punk kind of collapsed in England. Uh, you, you know, have a, so you have a comment uh, from Jay H Jay Hutch, who is our most notable commentator. Um, he says he wants to hear you talk about how the Sex Pistols and Frank Miller relate to each other. Ooh, um, I have to think about that for a little bit because I haven't actually meditated on those ideas. Um, because because there's a certain kind of punk rock kind of uh, produced in a way. I, I mean, produced isn't quite the right word, but like uh, uh, like, like Frank Miller kind of prefabricated himself, uh, at, you know, through through Neil Adams and whatnot. Uh, he he was a little more of a carnival barker than than uh, you know some of the others. He was actually much better with business. Uh, so so in the uh, you know late seventies, early eighties, whenever there was a big uh, deal about uh, residuals from DC Comics. Uh, he he just wrote his uh, note on the door uh, that said match it and walked out of the offices of Marvel. Um, you know, so 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 like he's he's certainly a lot smarter than than you know the people of uh, of the Sex Pistols, but uh, in a way like like uh, you know like how they were revolutionary, he was kind of revolutionary too. With the you know by bringing in ninjas to comics, uh, you know he he you know he. <laughs> I, I mean, mean would you say that? Here. Like, well, I would say Hellblazer would probably be closer in ethos to like Sex Pistols as far as just embodying the time and sort of yeah. like yeah, sort of pseudo nihilistic kind of like uh, <laughs> ethosless yet somehow with an ethos of like loose moral code that eventually comes together. But yeah, I mean, uh, Alan Moore was kind of behind it, so there was a lot more to uh, Constantine. Uh, yeah, you know w w when he first appeared, and and I mean, he was supposed to look like Sting too. So yeah, uh, yeah. you know, well, which yeah, most people don't know. Also in uh, the Great Rock and Roll Swindle, right? Yeah, I would also say that everything by Garth Ennis kind of has this uh, inspired, the punk inspired uh, ethos to it. Maybe not, maybe not, you know, the Sex Pistols variety of punk, but, you know, the later variety of punk, uh, very much influenced by that. Um, I, Jay Hutch also said uh, the movie should have ended with someone telling Johnny that Sid died by saying, no more va va boom as a, <laughs> as a reference to our first Kiss Me Deadly episode, where... <laughs> <laughs>
Maybe he should have died in an explosion like every other Gary Oldman movie. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a shocking ending, yes. Yeah, they get into the taxi cab, they drive off, and it explodes. The, the end. It's the, the Michael right, Bay Varn, ending. Varn, uh concluding thoughts on this. Yeah, uh, it's there's there's uh I found this movie both co conventionally the most well-made Alice Cox movie but also suffering from that in a lot of ways. Um in all of his other movies that I've seen and I've seen a fair amount of them, they're so oh, madcap. Keep a fair amount of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're so madcap that you can that the imposition of politics or of a message is not just fine. It's what the point is. Like you're not watching this for psychological realism or a biopic or anything like that. Um, it's both fun and absurdity, but also does have a point. This movie um, suffers from the fact that it it is reined in by being a fairly traditional biopic it's it's a good biopic, but the the need to have a message, and then the need to like portray the 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 grossness of this era and try to say something about punk rock means that despite having two really good main actors, what you end up watching is a movie where two very unlikable people be very unlikable for two hours, and then you just feel devastated that one of them killed the other one, probably, and that's. You know, I, I actually don't know that I take anything away from that. Um, uh, so it's 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 interesting in that way. Um, I watched this movie when I was, you know, uh, I am slightly younger than Conan. So um, but I, I'm uh, but I watched this movie in uh, high school, too. And my response to it is very different. Um <laughs> Uh, so the Sex Pistols and Pointillism were both, um, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> were... Oh, here we go. <laughs> Jay Hutch, Jay Hutch knows that as our, like, as the person that comments on our chat the most, like, it's just the most power to just make people respond in real time. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I, I, uh, I, I both appreciate this movie for what it is. And I, it is interesting how few kinds of movies uh, that were trying to be dishonest about drugs um, in, in the eighties, particularly these kinds of drugs. There were cocaine movies actually in the eighties all the time, but like not it's heroin. Also that, it's also that one movie where the cartoon Muppets and the cartoon uh, <laughs> Looney Tunes, they all just come together and tell you not to do drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, um. But I don't. I don't actually know. You know, it, trying to say that this. You know, the Sex Pistols are a betrayal of punk. Is kind of like. I don't know that I know what punk ever was from this movie, at all. You? Um, how would you? Yeah. It's got I mean, nothing to do with it. <laughs> it. It feels like the story. I mean, it does feel like the story of two lost teenagers who kill themselves, and yep. that's and they don't pretty necessarily much it. even feel. They don't feel like teenagers even i think the the symbolism of them makes kind of like like brings them to a level where like it's two just lost people that kill themselves mm -hmm. um and and i think that the fact that they are kind of pretty much teenagers uh should enormously impact the story because you know it's like it's literally just taking these two kids and bringing them to a level where like you know they're they both fucking one of them gets stabbed the other one ods like it's this sad tragic story um you know that that Alex Cox is trying to make a point, as I think, as pop, punk rock's um, kind of chosen chronicler, um, even even before he reaches the point where he's actually making these movies, uh, and he's just kind of on his second movie, he's still kind of punk rock. The punk rock's uh, like, like the post punk era's chosen chronicler, someone who's kind of chronicling these 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 moments in time, and um, I think he get kind of gets lost in that, kind of gets lost in having to say something. Um, and loses the point of the actual story, which is very sad and, and very tragic. And I think he, in, in some ways, he feels this weird uh, sympathy because he's kind of at the center of this movement. But I also think at the same time, he he kind of turns them to these symbols, which they're too young to be symbols. You know right. what I mean? Like, like two people are, like, 
these are like 19, 20 year olds. Like you're at, the, at that point, unless you've like led a fucking revolution or something, like it's you're kind of too young to be a symbol of anything. You're just like yeah, a kid. Are but, they're not. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> I would actually even another thing I thought about it is it tries to say something about depression and drug use and, and the, but it does so in montage. Um, yeah. So like it, it more evokes it as an excuse for the suicide pact. So you can both blame Sid Vicious and absolve him simultaneously. Um, which, you know, I, 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 like when I watch it, I find it very moving because it is the only time in the movie they make Nancy remotely sympathetic. (laughs) Um, but don't even uh, give her a big British accent. Right. (laughs) You know, but I mean, like it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's. A, they also actually, I was thinking about this. They also make her look like that actress and Nancy do not look that rough. Um, they actually like make her look. They make her look significantly older than Sid, which was not the case. And also, is specific to the makeup they put the actress in. I guess to make her look strung out, but like. Neither, neither Chloe, uh, neither Chloe Webb, nor did Nancy Spurgeon actually look that old, um, and so that no, also really there, messes. She's with not it. like she's not at the point where a lot of punk artists uh, were at some point where she's like a decade strung out, and mm-hmm. re- and it really starts to take a toll on somebody to the point where they look like they're 105 or something. You know what I mean? Like she's kind of at the point where it's been a few years of this, like a couple years of this, and she somehow managed to get to the United or to get to the United Kingdom and be running around like England kind of strung out, which like, you know, it is probably a significant point in her being strung out, but it's not like at the point where that would really be taking a physical toll necessarily on what she looks like. Um, well, and, and there's still that myth of like, you know, the noir kind of aspect of, of, you know, everything is terrible all the time, always that I think, and let's not to put a fine point on it. Like this is not that long again after John Lennon was killed. And there's still were people that like somehow blame Yoko for that. There is some blatant misogyny going on. And I'm not saying Alex Cox is misogynist. I'm just saying that like it was so tacit in filmmaking uh, at, at that time that it was just baked in. And like to prove to say otherwise is, is, is disingenuous. I love Repo Man. I think Repo Man's more important to punk than Sid and Nancy, frankly. Agreed. But be cool if there was a woman in there that like had some agency, right? That might be kind of nice, but I guess nobody thought about it, you know? Like, (laughs) well, I was actually thinking about like all portrayals of females, except for in except for in Walker, where she dies immediately. Um, (laughs) Trope. (laughs) um, They're kind of, uh, um, they're kind of either vapid or vicious in in these movies. now and, load longer vicious sorry right. <laughs> i mean but it, you know they're and, dead all right, of them and, dead. and you cannot notice it in uh you cannot notice it in repo man because it's such a minor part of the story um and you cannot notice it in walker because i mean other than i don't even know why she was brought in because she would have been already dead by the any point in the movie but whatever um uh but you you notice it in Sid and Nancy, I think. And maybe you didn't in 1986, but you sure as hell do now. Um, and that's, you know, I mean, and, and yeah, I mean, uh, yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> um, don't, so don't I, read I, it. Don't read it. Stay talking. Yeah, not, um, <laughs> I think, I think uh, um, that, that problem with this movie is it, it becomes glaring. And I, and I didn't notice it when I watched the other, other Cox movies. And after watching this movie, I noticed it in the other movies too. There's just so, a lot of Cox in these movies. Yes. There's a lot of Cox in these movies. Just like you there know? is in the podcast. <laughs> Any, yeah. <laughs> no faults of our own on this one, but uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we tried. Yeah. Where's Jamie? Um, <laughs> I yeah no I I I definitely I agree with that. Um, it's interesting to hear uh, Alex Cox talk in interviews now because he's kind of. I, so I've I've watched a lot of interviews with him for this show to get things, and obviously, like you know, I like he seems like an incredibly uh, nice and 
I don't want to say suggestible, but like, you know, a, a very, um, a very, I guess, sensitive guy to where, where the times are going because he, he seems to understand implicitly that, you know, the eighties and uh, you know, w- when he's kind of creating these movies that it's not the most woke time. And he seems to be a lot more sensitive to that now. And it's interesting because he's also, um, I would say one of these, I would say his politics at this point, instead of being kind of um, wall thrashing and, and anarchist, his politics are a lot more of the Jacobin variety um, at this point where, you know, if you hear an interview with him, he's, uh, he's, he's very, he's, he's very attuned to like, um, you know, maybe, maybe this isn't the most like kind of pushing against identity politics, but also being like, I understand that right now, like media representation is important. And it seems like he's been um, mellowed out, I think, uh, in, in his critiques of things by the last 30 years. That's um, actually a pretty common sort of worldview from a lot of the old school punk rockers who are, yeah. you know, sort, sort of my people, even though a lot of them are like older than me, like a little before my time. Um, you know, people I have on the show and people that I know from music, that's actually pretty common. Even folks that like had some pretty brutal stuff that was sort of like, wow, that didn't age too well. Like that's sort of like the, yeah, you know, hey, guess what? I wouldn't do that now. Like, I, I, you know, we did the thing we were going to do and we have to be held to account for it, but I would not do that now. Not everyone, of course, but like, I think that that's actually the, the aging punk rockers sort of uh, uh, move is to sort of like, all right, just igno- let's acknowledge that the world has changed and try to be better. We can't change what already happened, though. Well, I mean, because where else can you really go? As someone that's kind of, you know, uh, was, it, was at that point in, in the 80s, like, um, I think there's a more moderating force and hit, like, Alex Cox, as a professor, I think, has probably um, taught a lot of uh, students that were, you know, you know, like like women that wanted to become film directors, and I'm sure has created like a more like has thought about it and said, all right, maybe this isn't the way that these characters should be treated. I thought at the time maybe that you know I was creating a because he talks about Walker and how he thinks the two powerful women um, shaped Walker's destiny, but also in that interview acknowledges that like these are not you know these like one character dies at the beginning of the movie and one character kind of uh is not the most um yeah so, so yeah, like, one of them is basically like, fridged one of them is frigid yeah. you know it's like yeah. the, it's a it's a plot point to advance like the male protagonist's story yeah which is a thing well, he's he's become he, i think he's become a lot more aware of that um and so it's interesting to hear him at this point but also um i so his uh his really amazing his podcast i was listening to one that they called um I posted on Twitter. I think it was called like uh, political signifiers or something. It's like talking about like, you know, the political terms and they're talking about, um, which honestly I feel like is very in line with us. Like it, him and his uh, co-hosts are talking about what they think a leftist movement or a leftist movie would entail. Like leftist cinema, liberal cinema, conservative cinema. Now obviously they give, um, they give Clint Eastwood's um, uh, the, the uh, what's that movie? The, the Kyle whatever movie that Clint Eastwood did where it's the American Sniper. So they give American Sniper as a conservative movement like, yeah. <laughs> or movie as like the, you know, the, the example of that. And then they talk about, you know, how um, one of the biggest things he thinks a difference between uh, conservative and liberal filmmakers is that, um, you know, Clint Eastwood was willing to do it for $25 million or whatever, whereas Steven Spielberg wanted $35 million. And that's his that's the big difference between a liberal filmmaker and a conservative filmmaker is the conservative filmmaker will create propaganda for cheaper. Um, well, Bra- Breitbart and Fox News articles are free for everyone to read and New York Times yeah. and Washington Post costs you a dollar subscription. Yep. Right. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's a really interesting episode of his uh, his podcast that I, I think. But it also kind of I mean, it portrays kind of like almost like a, a, a like I think Democratic Socialist Jacobin point of view um with a lot of the other things he talks about rather than like an anarchist you know throw everything to the wall point of view which is i think what he had pretty clearly in in the 80s it's like you guys didn't overthrow the government and i wanted you to overthrow the government and that didn't happen (laughs) anyway conan final uh final thoughts i mean i think i said enough haven't i (laughs) (laughs) uh you know, I, I like this film a lot. I got way different takes from stuff than I did when I was a kid. And I think that's interesting. And that is a sign of a good film in a lot of cases. I think it's a well-made film. I think it's a mean film. I don't think it's exploitive, but I think it's very mean. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's fair in any way, shape, or form. But I think as a 
uh, the ability to just like watch something as entertainment. And if you can take away the fact that like there's some parts of this that are just not based in reality whatsoever. I mean, guys, Gary Oldman, like there's a reason he came to everyone's attention after this. He's a freaking badass in it. It's so good. But by the same token, is it a definitive history of the Sex Pistols or even Sid Vicious? Hell no, it's not. Uh, it's an interesting film, though. And it's interesting to me that as someone that not only enjoys music documentaries, but enjoys biopics, that I, I was very, I, I, believe me, this is going to go somewhere. When Walk Hard came out, I was so <laughs> fucking stoked and I was so into it. And not the least of which is because it basically was like, hey, here's all the tropes that all of these movies do. The Walk, and, Hard, is, look, Walk Hard is an amazing movie. It's so good. And it's and it's like I say that as someone that I'm a fan of all those things, but it's like uh they're doing the thing now where it's a guy, right? You get like perfect the, there's a perfect uh close-in because um when he's in the hospital and walk hard and he's like yeah, he's like uh he's like <laughs> he's like, Oh, I'm feeling hot. I need I need less blankets. So they take the blankets off and he's like, Oh my god, I'm so cold, I need more yep. blankets. They're like, All right, he needs he needs <laughs> more blankets. And he's like, Oh, I'm hot and cold at the same time. I need less blankets and more like so that's you know that that lines up better i think than a lot of things do with uh sid vicious in that in that documentary his interpretation of of what um what uh like going cold turkey on a tour is like well, yeah why is that funny well because we've seen that we, we we've seen yeah. that and and we know that and it, and it hits home because there is <laughs> some truth to it that has become absurd through the nature of storytelling so you know, again, the Roger Deakins cinematography is brilliant. I still like as a movie. I think Alex for Alex Cox, I think Repo Man, I like way better. And I think it's more important to punk. Uh, I get where he was coming from, though, that he felt betrayed. And he like made an, an angry movie about it that actually got a good amount of like mainstream attention that, of course, he would <laughs> post Walker. He would completely never see ever again. Uh, is it a great film? I think it's an interesting film and I think it had, I think it's flaws are, if not explainable, understandable. And I, I would kind of argue both sides of it in a lot of ways. Uh, I I, can I, you, yeah. can, can you discuss the sex pistols in relationship to the work of the spice girls? <laughs> so that's a great segue. <laughs> Uh, dude, because um, I, a friend of Tony who plays in my band, Conan Neutron, The Secret Friends, uh, <laughs> this guy Tug Walker plays in a band called right, The you Spice. Just, you just did. You just did what I what what, what I did, where you said Conan Neutron, The Secret Friends, Conan like, Neutron, oh, and Conan The Secret Neutron, Friends, and you got to add the end. And I did that this time. Well, I no, I just I just kind of slurred because A, I've been drinking, and B, I used to have a speech impediment where I spoke too fast, and I still kind of speak too fast. So right, I didn't over enunciate. <laughs> Conan Neutron and the Secret Friends, a friend of ours, uh, you know, friend of ours, he uh plays in a band called the Spice Pistols. <laughs> so, and I believe the conceit of the band is Sex Pistols songs in the style of the Spice Girls, and Spice Girls songs in the style of the Sex Pistols. I believe is the conceit of it. So yeah, that, that's a free plug for, for Doug Walker and company. Sounds Different great. Walker. <laughs> so so I, I have your uh, album cover up here. Um, Dark Passengers. Yeah. Yes. I forgot every time I've been on the show, I've forgotten to mention it. And like, that's just like, that's what releasing a record in the era of COVID is. It's like, oh yeah, we did this important thing. And it seems like a hundred thousand years ago and also last week. But uh, yeah. I think you've been uh, doing a little bit of the a little bit too much of the spice melange personally, but <laughs> <laughs> well, and you can you know at Bandcamp is the probably probably the best way to get it, uh, but it's on Spotify. Uh, you know, it's on as, all the places. As is this podcast, yeah, and yeah. Where do you think that would if the music would be? It'd be there. So if you want the sentence long band name, Kona Neutron and the Secret Friends, this, the record's called Dark Passengers. It's a concept record about depression and mental health. And uh, yeah, yeah, we, we have a, there's three other records as well. Uh, one one is a singles collection. Uh, I don't think I've ever mentioned the band explicitly uh, unless Jason Miles was talking about how he plays in the live band sometimes, uh, which is how I know all you fuckers, by the way. And uh, then, of course, f most people know Kona Neutron's Protonic Reversal, which is my long running music interview podcast uh, that happens every Thursday. 
8 Eastern, 7 Central, 6 Mountain, 5 Pacific. Uh, RadioNope.com, ProtonicReversal.com, anywhere you find your podcasts. Uh, all, there's a Patreon, but it's always free. Uh, there's been a lot. Of, if you're, Let's put it this way. I haven't had anyone from the Pistols on, but if you're into this kind of music, like you will find people that I have talked to that are definitely of interest to you. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's I, I, well, I'm really killing it with these plugs, right? I managed to plug Doug Walker's fucking Spice Pistols band, but I <laughs> blundered over my own. <laughs> There's something else we gotta you gotta you gotta plug one more time. Oh, uh, then I'm gonna be uh, uh, guest hosting for This Is Revolution. Yeah, the fucking yeah. Duh. I <laughs> oh something that might appeal to the audience of the show for us. What a wild idea! Yeah. Um, so Jason's uh, gonna uh, gonna be taking like a couple weeks off. And I'm going to be guest hosting. This is Revolution. And I think I believe it's Doug Lane is going to be the guest. Um, and we're going to be talking about uh, Amer faith in American institutions. And that's going to be on the 24th of this month. Uh, so a week from today, as we're currently, I probably shouldn't have mentioned that, huh? Well, it'll be the 24th of August. Go to This is Revolution, all the places that you would find that show. You, you look, look at his hat. Look, look at the hat. <laughs> <laughs> or oh, yeah. if, you're, if you're listening to the podcast, it says this is revolution. It's on a hat. There you go. Yeah. Um, I think everybody yeah, knows that pressure, man. Hat for the last, like, you know, four, <laughs> four episodes of this. I like this it, hat. It's a good hat. The only hat I think I like better is the one. Uh, I have one. It's a reptoid hat. It just says consume in the, like, they live John <laughs> Carpenter style. And, like, I used to love at peak COVID, I would go out with that hat, sunglasses, and, like, full mask on. And was like, yeah, I feel like I'm in Mad Max or something. Like. Suddenly the pandemic's fun. Mad Max. What whatever. <laughs> oh yeah. Mm. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Easter eggs. Dropping dropping Easter eggs. Anyway. Um, Barn, anything uh anything to plug? Uh I will be starting a semi-regular show over on TRI and Barn Blog co-produced, uh, released on Wednesdays once a month. I believe the third week of the month, starting in September, with Gene Bajalon on the political economy of tabletop role-playing games, which is both gonna be less serious Sick. and more serious than you would expect. Um so sounds um, a lot like sounds a lot like my uh my <laughs> show that's starting on This is Revolution on the first Wednesday of every month. Which is going to be a live crossover uh, movie episode starting on September first. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, we're all part of the the, the what the TIR extended universe, um, and I guess also increasingly the zero extended universe. Um, so uh, yeah, and so I'll be doing that and. Um, I have stuff coming out at zero. Sometimes I can't really always predict when for reasons that I can't talk about on air. And um, uh, stuff your, your wrangling career, sort of, yeah. Um, and um, we, uh, yeah, that's that's really it right now. Uh, I have I'm supposed to have another book coming out um, by Mysterioso Press, um, but. It's been stalled due to COVID for, I don't know, like six or seven months. So I haven't been talking about it. So I'm going to mention it now. So maybe people can go like, I don't know. Do Free whatever you do to get something. <laughs> do whatever you do to get something actually printed. Um, uh, people so, can, I don't know, read it. <laughs> yeah. Um, when it comes out. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's that. Uh, and that's really it. Um, I hate plugging. So I'm going to turn it over to everybody else. Andy? All right, I got uh, two things I want to plug. Uh, first of all, the, my my most recent album cover uh, for Fu and uh, Cole James Cash, which is uh, Sunset on Sunset. Uh, very very proud of the work I did. Um, I forget the other artist I worked with. Uh, he he kind of colored it and uh, did the graphic design side of it. But uh, that's my illustration, uh, and that's Spinny Circle. Is that great? There it is. Very cool. Very cool. I, uh, and uh, Cole was supposed to come on for the main reason of, of plugging this, but you know, yeah, yeah. But he, he was real busy telling us about how he didn't see the movie. <laughs> yes. But uh, no, it's, it's, it's a really good album. I'm, I'm really happy that my artwork's a part of it. So, you know, there's that. And um, I'm, I'm, I don't have a date yet because we're, we're still trying to figure out when we're, uh, when we're doing this, but uh, I am going to be doing an episode for my po movie podcast with um, uh, Milton Alamadi and Cuba, and we will be discussing the cinematic classic Wolf Warrior 2, 
and all of the uh, the important, you know, all of how um, uh, China and propaganda and Africa and all that intersecting stuff that's covered in the film uh, in, in very fun and interesting ways. And uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully, people will watch that. Cole's uh, Cole's album has uh, Mr. Motherfucking Esquire on it. Yes. It was like one of my favorite fucking rappers of all time. The, the song, uh, The Last Huzzah, which is honestly my favorite music video of any rap song of all time. And it's fucking amazing. But uh, so when Cole's like, hey, like, I, I, you know, I did a song with Mr. Motherfucking Esquire. I was like, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> I did um, an album cover for yeah. a song with Mr. Motherfucking Esquire. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, that's just that's always been one of my favorite music videos because uh, as someone who you know has always lived kind of uh, around around the sphere of Brooklyn. I mean, obviously, I live ninety minutes from there, but like that's where I lived for the first few years of my life. Like Das Racist was always one of my favorite uh, mm. like hipster rap collectives, I guess. And um, the fact that they were on that song and that Danny Brown was on that song, like it made it like one of my. It's still I still watch that music video all the fucking time. So uh, you know, hearing. Hearing that Cole made a song with him is like holy fucking shit. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I guess the thing that I would plug is obviously that I am going to be doing a once a month first uh first you know month or first week of the month uh movie stream on This Is Revolution, and I think I'm gonna have uh Gene, uh Kuba, and JG Michael on, and maybe maybe a couple maybe a guest other or two that we're kind of still working out, but. I'm going to have uh, mostly Gene and Kuba arguing about um, JFK by Oliver Stone. And it's going to be pretty, uh, something that I've been planning for, for a while. I've wanted to see like, you know, like professional historians and like, you know, just arguing about that movie. I thought it would be really amazing. So I'm really happy that I get to start off my, this is revolution. Well, not really start off. Cause I've, you know, I've been on as a guest, but to start off my, uh, this is revolution hosting is what I'd say on that note um the other thing to plug is that on thursday we'll be back on this channel with uh with with evil dead for our horror thursdays and we're gonna have um, we're gonna have the superstructure pod on um we're gonna have natalie smith will beeman and i'm not sure if max is gonna be on but um at least the you know at least the two of them um which you know it started out with a with with a a twitter argument that barn kind of squash um where i kind of (laughs) Put, put a, put From my Twitter beef to guest. Yeah, well, isn't that how it always goes? If you're not a fucking asshole, like you know, if you're willing to be like, "Hey, I put this tweet badly. You want to come on my podcast?" Actually, first somebody's like, "Hey, do you want to go on this podcast?" I'm like, "They're not going to want to go on the podcast." And then Barn kind of came in and like was kind of explaining to I think both parties like that you know like the 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 connections that are uh, it wasn't in bad faith. I don't think on either side. And, uh, and and so after that, I was like, hey, do you guys want to come on this podcast? So finally, after like a month um, of, of planning this out, they're going to come on for uh, for Evil Dead on Thursday, which should be really yeah. fun. A true my success entire, story. My entire career started out as a Facebook beef when I called Doug Lane an idiot 11 years ago. <laughs> so, and he's still uh, going to be <laughs> <laughs> no, the more things change, the more they stay the same. <laughs> All right. Well, we should call this quits before we hit three hours, which is getting pretty fucking close. Um, thank you all for coming on. Uh, we'll probably all. <laughs> yeah. Where's Jamie? Huh? She went. We miss you, Jamie. <laughs> all right. Left is best. <laughs> Thank you.